Great, okay. let me call the November 17th business meeting of Catholic Borough Council to order. Uh, let's move to the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic of the Tens, one nation, under the universal liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Call a roll. Absolutely. Council President Fred Bush. Here. Council Vice President Michelle Annapolis. Here. Council Member Barbara Fortner. Here. Council Member Rob McGrady. Here. Council Member Cindy Records. Here. Council Member Bob Weisberg. Here. Council Member Ira Winston. Here. Mayor Andrea Deutsch. Here. All right. Uh, are there any agenda additions or changes to consider? Um, so I have uh, three for council to consider. Uh, under item 9F, currently titled appointment of Samantha Bryant to the Montgomery County Tax Collection Committee, uh, I realized that actually um, should say uh, consideration of resolution 2022-30 to appoint Samantha Bryant as borough liaison to Burkheimer. Um, the second proposed change to the agenda I have is to add an action item on uh, 9I, uh, consideration of resolution 2022-31 to appoint Burkheimer as delinquent tax collector for EIT and LST. Uh, and both of those resolutions are in the packet. They just weren't properly noted here on the agenda. And then finally, under item uh, 15, I'd like to add for council to consider discussing an executive session, uh, a matter uh, regarding uh, litigation uh, with a um, um, borough contractor. And uh, can I get a motion to make the changes uh, as stated by the speaker? I move to amend the agenda item 9F to be in consideration of resolution 2230 uh, to appoint Samantha Bryan as the uh, liaison to Michael Ray. Is that right? The liaison to Burkheimer's tax code. Um, to add item 9i, uh, consideration of resolution 2222 31 to appoint Burkheimer as a delinquent tax collector, and to add an item to uh, agenda item number 15 to consider an executive session in addition to matter and provide litigation with a potential litigation. So sorry. So, uh, any discussion of the agenda changes? All right, we are voting not to make the changes that are recommended by the board. All those in favor of making the changes? Um, any opposed? Okay. And that has been changed. Uh, President's comments. So, I do have some comments. So we've received a lot of resident comments uh, about the parking proposals, which we discussed on November 3rd, um, but discussed where we are this evening. Um, so first of all, you can see a lot of the information um, that is coming out of the years that we've been, we've been working on this issue. The parking study itself done by Nelson Nygaard, uh, the agendas and minutes from the parking study task force, which was a citizen and borough council group that was looking at those recommendations. The agendas and um, minutes from the at our parking committee of borough council, those are all on uh, a web page on the borough site. If you search for parking, will come up it's entitled ad hoc parking, residential and guest parking proposed changes. So this evening, um, we're gonna be discussing changes to our proposal based on resident concerns and based on the discussions um, of the parking committee at their last meeting. Uh, there's no vote on tonight's agenda to advertise an ordinance. So actual policy changes 
will come further down the line. Uh, and uh, public comment is, of course, welcome on this topic, as on any topic, we'll be limited to three minutes uh, as we do. All right, uh, let's move on to the mayor's report. Um, just, just a very couple things uh, this morning. Um, just this afternoon, Montgomery County has uh, issued a code blue for our area starting at 9 p.m. tonight and going through going until uh, Monday morning. So uh, that, that means it's going to be extra cold and, and please don't leave your pets outside. And uh, and uh, if you need any resources, if anybody is in need of resources, uh, uh, the county has resources available uh, to make sure everybody stays safe. Um, check on your neighbors to make sure, you know, if you see anything funny, let, you know, make sure they're OK. If you need the police to do a wellness check, we can do that as well. So uh, that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, uh, we're going into Thanksgiving week, and this is our, my last opportunity to just wish everyone a happy holiday. I am thankful for all the volunteers who work so hard uh, to make this borough run. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone for their hard work on all the committees and borough council and, and everything to try and do best by our friends and neighbors. Um, I also want to give a thank you to uh, the members of our police force, including Mike Vernaccio, who's been holding down the fort while we uh, while we uh, search for a, our next chief. So I just want to give thanks to all those who who are working so hard to, to make Narberth the best place it can be. Thank you, Mayor Deutsch. All right, let's move on to public comments. So I will start uh, in the room here. So I'll start with the first row. So three minutes, just speak your name and address. Uh, I'm Adam Kazin. I'm from 156 Marion Avenue. And I'm gonna be speaking about the Sabine property. Narberth owns a wonderful resource, the Sabine property. In addition to the Sabine property, we in Narberth will have another park at three Elmwood, almost two acres. The future op options for the Sabine property are using it the full area as a park or creating a park with a portion of the property being used for a commercial building. This building would provide rent to Narberth. I support using a portion of the Sabine property for a building and also creating a large park. The Borough Council must decide what is in the best long-term interest of the residents of Narberth. This decision by the Council must not rely on just the neighbors, must not rely on just those losing their leases within the Sabine buildings, and not just rely on the loudest voices. The Council makes decisions to create the best future for our community. The transformation of the Sabine property will be costly. The cost of demolition is over a million dollars. Creating a cohesive park will be very costly. There will be continued maintenance costs for a large park. This costs a lot of money, which the burden will be on all the residents of Narberth. Using a portion of the property for a building does take into account the concerns of the immediate neighbors. The building will be fronted and located on Montgomery Avenue, away from the residential neighbors. A building on Montgomery Avenue provides Narberth with a land lease. This lease provides needed and necessary money to assist with the cost of a large park at the Sabine property. This is an opportunity to be smart about both the open spaces and the financial future of Narberth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the second round. Public comment? Yeah, John Cox and E400 North Narberth. Um, it seems like you're taking a third stab at the uh, waste uh, reallocation fees. Um, I, I, I see that now it's $400 for residential properties and 295 for commercial properties and $100 for um, multi-apartment buildings. I still don't see where $100 is a fair number for apartment buildings in comparison to the household, <clears throat> $400 and even less for a commercial building. Regarding the uh, <clears throat> parking program, the Nelson Nygaard study was taken over two days in December of 2016 so I don't see how that could be representative of the problems that we have today. 
And I don't believe I was told by the parking committee to come here because you're going to determine the fees for the parking permits. There shouldn't be any fee really for that permit beyond the nominal amount to be fair to all the residents. Park, parking, you're going to make more problems by creating all these intricacies. <clears throat> And then regards to the park at Sabine Park, um, there should be a full length park there. We will bear the burden of the cost of the park. We have kids and children and multiple uh, <clears throat> um, athletic programs that need these fields to, for our kids to compete. Okay, if you need to put a little building on a corner, if you if, if it's Financially feasible, by all well and do, but there should be a full length, and that doesn't cost a lot. You pick up the gravel and you plant grass. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like it for the room. Sure, just our usual, uh, just so everyone knows the, uh, the Zoom protocol. If you're on Zoom and would like to make a public comment, Either please use the raise hand function or literally raise your hand. Uh, I will call on you and you will get a prompt on your screen giving you the opportunity to unmute. Uh, at the three minute mark, you will be uh, re muted. Uh, so, uh, is there anyone on Zoom who would like to make public comment? I see no public comment on Zoom. Um, we have received email from the instruments, so hopefully <laughs> that covers what she was going to say. Um, let's move on to the consent agenda. And did the borough council do the consent agenda items? Uh-oh. Ha! Um... I'm a co-host because um, I'm going to be sharing my screen later. So obviously the owl decided to drop out on us. I see that. Yeah. Oh, let me text them. Oh, I think they know. I, it was making booping noises in the room, but you can. But I think they know. Okay. Because I just is a man to get up. So. Okay. But, yeah. We had problems with it um, Tuesday morning during the parking committee meeting too. So yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Zoom. I, I think they keep doing updates. That then I had to update before I was allowed to get on tonight. Yeah. See, and I haven't had to do that, and I I've, I've been really surprised because I've been in Zoom a bunch. Yeah. Fred texted me. He said, "Yeah, they are pausing the meeting for the moment while they work on that. Okay. Ooh, well, while they're doing that, I'm going to go fill up my water glass. Forgot to do that." Okay. Now it's like they always say technology is wonderful until it isn't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just like uh, yeah, I was nerve, and then at first my audio wasn't great. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I've had that happen before too, and I'm not sure what that is. It, it fixes itself. Sorry, everyone. My, uh, my laptop battery uh, died. I thought it was plugged in, and uh, it was not quite all the way in there. Oh. oh. <laughs> Got We're it. Back. Let me just get the TV back on uh, in the room here, and we will resume the meeting. I was telling the folks here in the meeting, it wouldn't be a council meeting if my computer didn't do something funny to us, so, as is tradition. Thank you. 
think we are almost there. We do have we do have Zoom and the recording going. Okay, um, do we, so we have audio right now. Yeah. yeah. So Barbara and yes, exactly. Andrew, you can hear us. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, okay. Can you see us? Not, not, this not time. yet. So you'll have to. So are, are you okay with us proceeding here and uh, without the without showing video? You can you can raise something audibly. Uh, if you want to make a point, and okay. I'll let you know. We're still working on getting the video back on, so I'll let you know uh, any situation changes. Yeah. Okay. You can see us? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. That sounds like everybody's okay with the meeting proceeding. Obviously. So there we go. All right. So uh, the last action that was taken, there was a motion to. For the consent agenda items, to consider the consent agenda items, it was seconded. So that's I seconded. I seconded that, but I think that was right when the thing. I didn't. I didn't hear you. So I think Cindy officially uh, is credited with seconding it. But nonetheless, I thought Cindy made the motion. Oh, Cindy made the motion. All right, my mistake. And I seconded. I thought, but I couldn't tell. Okay. Is there any discussion of the consent agenda? I have a question. Um, there was no um, formal resignation from Jim Spear, a letter or something. And so I'm just wondering, do we know what effective date that's going to be as of what he wants? I, I just had expected there would be something in the packet, um, unless it got added within the last you know, couple hours, but I didn't see it. So I just wanted to make sure we know what we're voting on. Communication with him that I believe it would be effective January 1st. That, that would be, uh, that the uh, resignation would be effective January 1st. Okay, so that's what that's Samantha. Yeah, he had sent an email to me, but it contained other borough business, and so I couldn't just plug that into the packet, but that is my understanding as well. So my uh, apologies to council that wasn't included in there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. No question, but can I just thank Jim Spear for his yes. many, many years of dedicated service on the Planning Commission? Yes, thank you. Yes. Do we know how many years? How many years has Jim Since 2012. <laughs> A decade. Yeah, wow. decade of service. <laughs> and his continued work on the Shade Tree Commission and the Narbor of Civic Association. Yeah, you know what? We have a long agenda as it is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> everything Jim does for this borough will be here till tomorrow. <laughs> An excellent point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. All right. Uh, all those in favor of passing the consent agenda? Just raise your hands. Any opposed? All right. Action 9A. Um, I move that council consider um, adopting resolution 2022-26 for approval of 650 Montgomery Avenue amended final plan. Second. All right. Um, wanna start this sure, I'm happy to, and I see the representative of the applicant is here as well. Just the, the history of this matter, uh, this is the third time this plan is, is back before council for approval. The first time was the Revolution 2020, um, and as you recall, this is a 25-unit apartment mixed-use building at 650 uh, Montgomery Avenue. 
Uh, the original plan called for a wall uh, that council accepted. Wasn't completely happy with, but they, you know, they accepted it. Um, due to some changes in potential tenants, they came back for a, a second change of that plan, which made that sort of an at-grade patio uh, and expanded the landscaping, but the building itself was remained the same. I do believe there was a one parking spot removed, but still parking compliant. That was again approved um, by council with the approval of the, both the planning commissions. Uh, due to tenant changes again, uh, there is a third amendment to that uh, patio wall area, um, which I'd let the applicant maybe provide more details, but uh, according to the engineer letter, uh, a summary of that is sort of a hybrid between the original plan and the amended plan uh, with a mix of elevated and at-grade patios along the meeting house lane frontage. Um, the approved retaining wall would remain near the intersection of Montgomery Avenue with a staircase and an ADA accessible lift providing a connection to the at-grade patio uh, and the parking spaces at above the building have been better uh, configured or reconfigured to better accommodate the building entrance. Um, so it's sort of a, a, the building itself remains the same but around the building the surrounding patio walls are, are amended uh, and that's due to again um, different tenant fixtures and, and needs. The resolution for approval is uh, essentially the same as the last one uh, that was approved um, as relevant, um, uh, accepting the changes to the, to the plan. And do you think that's an accurate summary? Of Very much indeed. Yeah. I'm happy to walk everybody through if anybody would like to. I'm not sure that's going to be necessary unless uh, anybody on council wants to. This is a relatively minor change, and we've discussed similar changes in the past. I'm sorry, just to clarify, it's just almost like the corner, the, the corners of. No, 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 I want you to pull off. 30 seconds. <laughs> this, this, 30 seconds. But look, okay. look, look cold into the corner. Because I was so opposed to the wall. So, so, yeah. so, so here we go. This is this is round one. This was a wall yeah, all the way wall. through. Ten foot per foot staircase wall. over yeah. there. Round two was we brought this to grade right. and we just slowed this ramp up all yeah. the way to here. Okay. Now that we're yeah. back in a multi-tenant, multi-tenant configuration, we can't have a slope here because we need secondary means of egress on the patio level. So we're basically taking what was the staircase over here and shifting it to here. And this is still this patio. is still totally at grade, okay. totally walkable onto a meeting house, one, two, three different means of e e uh, Pedestrian access right onto Montgomery. Okay. Bike rack is still there. Okay. This doesn't. This never changed in the beginning. Okay. This here is the same as this, which is the same as this. Got it. Thanks. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you. And it was Thanks, reviewed sir. by the planning commission. I think just this week. Yeah, there have been no serious concerns raised. I don't think by anybody who's correct. And, and any of the minor concerns or not concerns, but minor points have changed and. and uh, our borough engineer's letter are able to be addressed prior to the planning report. Okay. And that would be the condition. All right. Any other questions for council? All right. Uh, let's vote on resolution 2226 to approve the amended plan for 650 Montgomery. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. All right. Uh, action item 9B, the EIT. Oh, I move the Borough Council adopt Ordinance 1051 for EIT. Is there a second? Oh, second. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Sure. So uh, we've got lots of discussion on it. Uh, ultimately, this is a half percent. Uh, EIT, the goal of it being to provide, as we'll do in an ordinance and a couple items here, to provide property tax relief via uh, a homestead exemption, as well as to fund borough uh, infrastructure projects uh, in the future. Um, so, um, you know, I'm uh, grateful to council for giving consideration to it. And, um, you know, if there are any remaining questions, happy to talk through it, but we've talked a lot the last five or six months about it. And the effective date is going to be January 1st. And we will be 
notifying residents about this and the uh, the LST, the homestead exemption, and all of these tax changes. Um, yes. Okay. The ordinance was properly advertised, uh, properly submitted to the law library for review, and it's been on uh, possession of borough for public display as well. Uh, comments? Yeah, I mean, I know it's probably going to be covered in a later item, but I, I assume at the same time we're not talking about changing the mill of the property tax. Right. Millage rate. That will that will come up during the budget discussion. But right, the property tax millage. The, the the millage that is specifically for property tax will not change. Oh, we are going to be changing the way that so no. we're going to be applying a separate solid waste fee, right. which which isn't a tax. Which isn't a tax, right? That's a fee. Understood. So yes, okay. We are not increasing the property tax millage or lowering. Or lower I know. I, I subject. People are going to see some changes to their to their tax tax form, but we are not raising or lowering the property tax millage. I believe that's accurate. Thanks. Any other comments about the EIT? All right. Let's vote on approving ordinance 1051, establishing an EIT. All those in favor? Uh, any opposed? <coughs> yes. Okay. Uh, 9C VLST. Um, I will not move it. Okay. Because I'm opposed to it. So it seems yeah, fair. sorry. The motion sheets are just, we just go like in alphabetical okay. order. They're not, they're not any intentional. Someone else, like so I, move the Someone else will have to move that. I move the Pro Council adopt ordinance 1052 for local service tax. Is there a second? Someone? Okay. All right. <laughs> Discussion of the LST. Um, so, Lord Marion School District already has a five-dollar uh, LST. <clears throat> uh, this proposal, this ordinance, would implement uh, a forty-seven-dollar uh, borough uh, LST. It's an annual uh, tax charge to anyone who works in the borough. And there's an exemption for anyone who makes twelve thousand dollars or less a year. Which is also true for the EIT. Right, also the EIT. And again, this ordinance was properly advertised, uh, sent to the law libraries, and been on uh, possession of the for public examination. Thank you. Any other? Well, I'd just take an opportunity to say, I'd just take an opportunity to say why I oppose it. I, and it's not, that, it's not that I oppose the LST, I oppose the amount. Um, when, when, the way this works is that when you get your payroll check, and you're in, you're a, you know, you're a you're employee in Arbor. Once a year, there's a five dollar deduction from the school district on your paycheck, and so I get that. My wife gets that. Anyone else who gets a paycheck that they can grow in Arbor pays five dollars to the school board. Somebody who say works a minimum wage job, maybe earning twelve thousand and one dollar in their minimum wage job, will also get that same five dollar deduction from their paycheck annually. Um, for the borough of Narbeth to now tack on $47 annually to a person who's earning, say, $12,001, I think it's rather, I, th I don't think it's right, because I think that we have probably have 100, we have, we have many minimum wage employees within the borough of Narbeth doing all kinds of different jobs, we probably earn a little more than $12,000. If the, that's a, that's almost five to six hours of labor for that person. Um, it's just to pay the norm with LST. So I'm not opposed to the LST, I'm just opposed to the amount. If we want to like actually formalize an LST and charge five dollars like the school district does, like I could see that being reasonable. Like then so then a person who's earning minimum wages like kicking in maybe a fraction of their first hour of employment, but not their first seven hours of employment in the broken earth. You know, like, it's just, and that's in addition to all the other deductions that are made by, you know, FICA, Social Security, state, federal taxes. So that's that's why I find it distasteful. So 
I have a comment as well. I was, I was unfortunately not able to attend the, the meeting where we moved this word advertised, so I did not um, have anything to say about it at the time. <clears throat> I did listen to the meeting. I thought Bob's comments were um, important and persuasive. Um, and I would not have voted that with it forward. But it, in addition, I have like sort of two other independent reasons that I, I'm not a fan of this uh, tax. The first is there are a couple of things in here, and yeah, I would have mentioned them last month had I been here, but um, that I don't actually uh, know how to interpret them as drafted. Uh, for example, business is an enter enterprise activity, profession, et cetera, that is conducted for profit or, ordinar or ordinarily conducted for profit which would seem to include a nonprofit that engages in a business that would ordinarily be conducted for profit. And I think that would sweep Get Cafe within this. And I'm not comfortable um, asking those employees to pay this tax. The second is that um, in terms of the definition under imposition of tax rate, uh, it basically just sort of is, is generally where it would apply. Upon the privilege of engaging in an occupation with the primary place of employment within Norbert Burr during the tax year, each person who exercises such privilege for any length of time during any tax year. I, I, it's not clear to me what kind, what occupations that would sweep within it if it's somebody who's a tiling job that lasts for a month and that's where they're primarily employed. Are they expected to report this? A contractor who's working on something for three months. <clears throat> so that's not really clear to me. I'm not really comfortable passing something if I can't tell what activity it actually brings within it. And that, so that was my first objection. My second objection is this is <clears throat> intended to raise about $25,000 a year, I believe, estimated. And as I went through it, I saw there are so many um, administratively burdensome things that has to be reported quarterly. Um, there are a variety of exemptions that need to be tracked that need to be filed annually, that need to be followed up on to make sure that they're legitimate. There's a need to do a lot of prorata calculations because employment doesn't always last for a year or even a whole quarter. And special rules for concurrent employment, trying to figure out there's a whole schedule of grade eight, like graduating priority of claim, depending on the, the situs of the tax, like where the employment happens. Self-employed individuals have to report every quarter. Um, they're going to have to pay, I assume, Berkheimer to administer and enforce this. I think it will also take, it will be unavoidably, it will take a lot of administrative time because there will be closed cases and there will be people complaining and there will be people who don't, who don't report because it's just kind of burdensome. And all that for $25,000 a year it's not really a policy that makes a lot of sense to me, so I'm a little bit against it. John, do you want to address the question of whether a nonprofit or any of the, any of the questions raised by? Well, I think it's, it's a little bit more intricate as to whether or not it's a nonprofit or not. These definitions were taken uh, directly from the Local Tax Enabling Act uh, on the recommendation, as uh, all of the processes within the ordinance from uh, Berkheimer uh, upon their review to keep it consistent with the other municipalities that have this tax uh, because they, they do administer it and then there is that Montgomery County Tax Collection Committee uh, that reviews any of the, the issues and appeals related to, to, to this ordinance. Um, my understanding is that if you are a, even if you're a nonprofit activity, if you're doing an activity that is outside of that nonprofit, uh, it, it would be taxable. Um, so I can't, I don't think it's a black or white issue as to whether or not a nonprofit would, would apply uh, if there's a nonprofit doing profit activities. For example, Burrow and Tool and Sabine, um, in those municipality, it would be a different outlet. Well, and, and that would be up to the determination of, of uh, Burkheimer uh, and the Tax Collection Committee to determine if, you know, if, if there's an appeal on that ground as whether or not it's a taxable event. Do you know, are you aware of Get Cafe? I'm aware of Get Cafe. So what do you, in your opinion, would they be liable for this? I mean, I guess the question is, you know, what are they paying taxes on now? Um, I mean, if right now, are they paying taxes on their income for, for the work? It is sort of a hybrid um, because of the service they provide, even though it is for a, a nonprofit purpose. I'm not sure if they have a foundation set up. I'm not sure if it's all business activity. 
uh, I, would, I would think that if their their income is primarily, or those those workers are primarily serving that nonprofit element, uh, it would be up to, to them to determine how to classify that in the workers. And again, it, if you work for a nonprofit, you still pay taxes on the money you make as a worker. Regardless. So, um, you both make compelling points. Um, and not to belabor or underscore what I think is compelling on each. I would like to ask Samantha about the administrative burden of $25,000 to your point. Is it? Is it there? There's, there's no administrative burden. You don't perceive it. Sure. So, Berkheimer charges a, a percentage, but I think it's like one percent yeah. that they charge. Plus, I mean, if they have to deal with that's just for the standard, but if they have to deal with people who are not paying their taxes for whatever reason, it's, it's a there's more expenses there. But yeah. if it, it it's one percent of the standard collections. So, and I think another factor that, you know, is one of the reasons we brought this forward is because it's a very common tax in Pennsylvania. I think almost all municipalities have it. Yeah, I mean, if I had to, you know, completely rehash what we've talked for the last four months, you know, we have very limited opportunities to, uh, to you know, diversify our revenue base. We're incredibly property tax dependent. This is one of our few avenues the state gives us to diversify, um, you know, our revenue stream. Um, you know, a lot of these concerns are, you know, the, the first, you know, in this process I've heard about them. Um, you know, obviously the, the, all the, you know, regulatory things that go with the $5 school district one, uh, you know, people are already having to do and they would, you know, be the same whether we have, you know, ours, uh, ours as well. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think, Again, I mean, our you know our choices our choices are limited in terms of raising revenue, and this is one of the options that we have, which is why we um, why we pursued it. And um, you know, I would argue that you know I certainly understand the concerns about the amount. Uh, I would say that people who work in the borough who don't necessarily live here um, benefit from borough services the same way that residents do. And again, hence why you know there's an opportunity to levy the attacks on those folks. So I would say that my understanding is that the, the administrative burden on the taxpayer does change. That you have to withhold differently if it's five dollars versus if it's yeah. But it's not two. the it's not the individual who's going to do the withholding. Right. It's your you know it's your uh, your payroll that's going to be doing it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was like I mean, to make some at this point. Like, look, we have a payroll service in our business. It's just, it's just automatic. Like the payroll service puts it in. If you have a hundred employees, it's going to be done a hundred times. It's automatic. What bothers me is that we're sipping from the income, the meager income of some people who are making literally very little money. We're going to basically contribute six to eight hours of their labor to give the road an arbor. 50 bucks. Like, I just think it's unconscionable. I, I got behind the EIT. I, I came to see the EIT because of the need to diversify the tax base. I understand how, you know, I understand that it's a nice, it's, it, there's some rational, it's rational. I wish the Commonwealth would, like, raise the threshold of the minimum taxable amount from 12,000, say, to, like, 80,000, I think, would be more equitable. Like, I think, but I think that's going to be up to the Commonwealth, and hopefully with a new leadership in the Commonwealth level, we can get that to change. But, and I'm all for diversifying tax base, but sipping 50 bucks from someone who's making $12,050 from the kids or who are, you know, it's just unconscionable to me. I just, I think it's wrong. If we want to do it, like if we want to institute this administratively so it's in, in place, so that we have we can go to it if we ever really need it, then let's do five bucks. Let's not do fifty bucks. That's that's just we yeah, see it. Let me I would have raised it earlier, but I wasn't on finance administration yeah. committee. And when, when we did when we did visit this issue at the last meeting, I objected for the same reason then. So I, I did raise my concern as soon as I was aware of the issue. 
If council were to pay a different amount for the LST, would it require re-advertising the ordinance? Yes, all three Okay, times. well then we can't, then your choice is unfortunately either yes or no then. Well, yeah, it'd have to be another year before we're going to change the amount of payments to for this year. All right, uh, <laughs> who hasn't spoken? So, Barbara? Yeah, um, I had a question. Um, Michelle mentioned that there's quarterly reporting required. Um, uh, it, it, Manager Bryant, could you speak to that? I Is that like required of individuals? Uh, like I said earlier, it's not required of individuals. It's whoever, whoever a company, whoever's responsible for payroll at a company, whether it's an employee or an outside entity, that would be, be like any other withholding. With due respect, it's sort of far from self-employed individuals, and I think we have a fair number of them in the borough. So yes, yeah, so many other withholding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They report quarterly. And there are some self-employed individuals who have very, you know. All right. Let's let's try to <laughs> go with the back and forth. Is, is the process different though if you're already paying five for the process than if you're paying forty-seven? Well, there's that's a question. There's if a I, if I, like if I know that concern in advance of the meeting, I certainly could have asked for a time yeah. down out of more definitive answer. On there, that. there is like it, it's the process is different if you're only paying five. It's it's an annual, I believe, as opposed to a either a quarterly or weekly, I forget which. I mean, of course, the other thing with this too is if council changes the number, you know, the you know our the twenty twenty three budget is based upon that number, and uh, again, again, yeah, and. Uh, in the grand scheme of the borough, uh, is $25,000 that much money? No, but in the scheme of the decisions we make for the 2023 budget, uh, yes. I mean, we would have to substantially change something council previously did. Uh, we'd have to you know, back off on something uh, to the tune of 25,000. So uh, not to say we can't do it, it's just that's you know, kind of a, this is like, like we have to advertise the budget tonight to make our deadline, to, uh, you know, get it done without having a special meeting, you know, in the holiday time. I will, I will definitely agree that it would have been better to have this discussion earlier. <laughs> um, anybody else who hasn't spoken? I mean, you're saying the budget can go forward. If this is voted down, the budget will have to be changed. Yeah. It would require a special meeting. No, uh, just you all tonight here at the table would have to decide on the fly what you're going to cut from the budget to make that money up, or you're going to have to eat it out of fund balance. I'd be in favor of finding twenty-five thousand dollars in cuts. Well, that's this is a that's a separate. Well, topic. I'm mentioning it so, because it's part of the discussion. Part of the discussion. Um, we're being uh, we're being told that unless we vote yes on this, we're going to have a budget problem. So I'm saying. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, will have to, we will have to take that into account when it okay. comes time to deal with the budget. Either it will result in, I mean, we're already projecting that we're going to spend down some of the fund balance. We'd either be spending down more or we would need to find uh, cost savings somewhere in the budget. You would be, create, as we talked about the budget, the fund balance that we're using up is for non-recurring expenses. Whereas this would be recurring revenue, so we'd be creating a twenty-five thousand dollars structural deficit. Otherwise, any other? Cynthia, did you want to say something? But there, on the budget part, but there are some potential changes in the projected budget that we could shift that twenty-five thousand dollars. It's certainly within our power, but that's a discussion for later. <laughs> no, I, it, but it would inform my. I think I, I, I actually think it's a discussion for now because we're talking about taking that money out of the pockets of people who made very little money <laughs> versus, you know, like sort of maybe tightening our belts a little bit for the sake of the borough, for the sake of those, those wage earners who live in the borough, or, or raising the millage late a tiny drop. Mm -hmm. We can't, I mean, we can't change, well, I mean, we can't really change the millage at this point, unfortunately, because we'd have to advertise that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, I mean, I should say that, John, council would have enough time. If you want to change the property tax millage, mm -hmm. we'd I, I, have to approve that tonight so we could advertise it in time for a council. My, my preference would be not to increase the property tax millage. I think that it's going to be a lot simpler to Yeah, I would rather, I, 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 I would agree, program. I would rather cut an expense if you want to forgo this tax, yeah. Yeah. All right, since people are, are asking for this, I will throw it out there that I 
believe we can cut the second parking controller that is in the budget. I believe that um, we are, based on what we're hearing from the community, we're not going to be significantly increasing our parking enforcement. And as a result, uh, the second parking controller is less necessary and uh, we can, you know, if, if it turns out later on next year that everybody is recovered from the pandemic fully and there's two new buildings on Haverford that are generating a lot of traffic and it's an issue, this is something we can revisit down the line, but I was going to propose this anyway, that, um, that spending item could be removed from the budget. Could I um, ask a question about that too? Um, what's proposed in the budget right now is for a 35 hour a week um, parking controller. When we had a brief period earlier this year when we had one full time parking controller and a part time parking controller, and the reason for that was so that we could have um, coverage of the meters on Saturdays. Um, some coverage of there are some uh, two hour zones where the coverage goes to 8 p.m. So you could have some more evening coverage. Um, is there, a, if we don't have that, and that was before we talked at all about increasing the enforcement period. So, um, is there room in the budget if we wanted to have a part-time controlling officer, con yeah, <laughs> controller, um, uh, enforcement officer with the not having the LST? And, and is that even necessary? I, I, I kind of leave that up to you, Manager Bryant. Do we need, do we feel that we need the part-time? I mean, at one time we did feel that that was important to have this extra uh, uh, flexibility to really um, have some enforcement in the hours that just don't work for someone who's working a regular, you know, eight, five, eight to four, Monday through Friday. I mean, yeah, I think the borough would certainly uh, benefit from it, but I do think there were some valid, uh, you know, uh, uh, equity is right word, concerns from council about the nature of a part-time job versus a full-time job and you know what sort of employer uh, we want to be um so i would say this i mean would there be a benefit to having a part-timer absolutely is it something the borough i mean i don't necessarily want to speak for the police department or the mayor or anything like that but um, in my opinion is is an additional parking controller absolute need right now no I think Barbara's also asking about cost. I think that going from a 35-hour parking controller with benefits to a 20-hour parking controller without benefits would be 25000 I mean, they'd be in the same ballpark. So if we were to make those two changes, it would be pretty similar. I still don't like the idea of a part-time parking controller, but I think yeah. it, would be a, it would be a wash. Right. And that's not my first choice either, but, you know, if that, I guess I'm, I'm just looking at it from the standpoint of if we, See that there's really a need for that. That it would, you know, maybe we're back to considering that again. That you know, a part-time enforcement. Uh, so, uh, nothing to say we couldn't um, put the LST back in next year at, at a reduced price, which means it wouldn't be completely structural deficit because some of it could come back. I mean, I'm not, I understand yeah, the point yeah. you're making, uh, Manager Bryant, but I mean, it, it's not necessarily a permanent decision here. And I suspect we would have voted for a lower rate if that were a possibility tonight. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Right. So, it's, I mean, I just want to emphasize to council, like, you know, this is not, I mean, obviously, for a council meeting, shouldn't be, you know, pre scripted Kabuki theater affairs, but, <laughs> you know, um, these sort of significant changes, obviously I was not prepared tonight to discuss this topic and answer the concerns and questions raised. And, you know, we've already paid hundreds of dollars for advertising in this ordinance. You know, now we're gonna have to go back and make change. Like, there's staff time that was spent on this and now it's gonna have to be spent again. And I just, I just would encourage members of council, like, obviously if you have concerns, I wanna address them and I wanna solve them. 
Um, but it really hurts my ability to do that when at the last possible decision point we bring them up. And council as a whole, I'm not, I'm not saying, obviously all of council has concerns based on what was shared here tonight. And if council had misgivings, it just would have been better to know them a month ago than now. Uh, yeah, this is not to say anything about you, Bob. You did raise your concerns. Not saying anything about Bob, not saying anything about Michelle. It sounds like council as a whole tonight has some misgivings, you know, about this. And um, just for future borough business, I mean, this is just standard municipal operating practice. This is not how these things are supposed to go. And I just want to be very clear about that. And I, and I appreciate you, Fred, on the fly, by thinking of a solution. I, I, I just want to say, like, in defense of all of us, that we saw the EIT coming for a year. We've all had a long time to think about it and discuss it. This this LST, literally, it came blindsided to me. Like, I didn't know that it's just being discussed in finance administration. It was never something pre-introduced earlier on before we were asked to look at it. We never discussed the amount or anything like that, or I would have been clear. And I'll apologize for it. I mean, you make a really compelling case that other municipalities all have this. It seemed like standard operating procedure. And to speak of myself, you know, over the last two weeks, we have gotten probably 100 emails about parking and and what that five, it wouldn't be five dollars, what the burden of the additional fee would be. So I will say, I heard you loud and clear about because you were very clear with your objections. Um, but those, I mean, I, I wouldn't venture to guess how many emails we've all received, but talking about that guest pass fee did have me reconsider what you're thinking about. I mean, and to hear you both talk, I do completely appreciate this is not helpful. But I've heard the emails from residents saying this is a financial burden. Um, so to hear you say it again, I'm taking note. All right. Um. So what would be, uh, do we want a motion to table? Do we want to have a vote? Well, you have a motion on the table, so you can vote yes or no on it. Okay. It's, I mean, it's up to you all. I mean, you can either vote on the motion on the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could have lined up the person who made the motion. I'm not, not going to unwind it. Let's just go to vote. Uh, is there any other discussion at this point? Okay. Uh, we are voting on resolution 1052 for the LST. That's oh, right. Uh, ordinance 1052. Sorry. Ordinance 1052. Right. It's not a resolution. Ordinance 1052 uh, for the LST. Um, all those in favor of passing the ordinance. In favor. <laughs> uh, all those opposed. Okay. Motion fails. Let's move on to 10D, uh, the homestead exemption. I move that the council adopt ordinance 1053 and resolution 2022.7 for homestead exemption. Okay. I second. Thank you. I second. Thank you, Barbara. All right, uh, homestead exemption. To summarize. I, I would point out that. It, Obviously, the homestead exemption was, would have been paid or could have been paid money from the local services tax or in addition to the EIT, but, but usually it's paid from local services tax. So, provide that refund. The local services tax would well, be in this case, well, you know, we've always been through the EIT. Yeah. This is definitely coming from the EIT, but right. the local services so tax would have been paid. The local services tax. The specific reason for it is real estate tax reduction that's provided. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure the finances, but if that made an impact, I just want to make it aware. If, if that's how it was done. No, I mean it's, it's all just money. fungible from both the EIT and the uh, local services sites could be used to offset. Correct. But it just local, can't be property. It, it can be both. I'm not sure how it's, it's budgeted, but the local services tax can only be used for a few items, one of them being that real estate tax reduction. So I just promised to use 25% of it for police, fire, medical, and uh, we, we, when we, when so we discussed like, yeah, the EIT, that was yeah, one that's of the major right. that's right. that's right. that's right. that's right. that we were going to be using EIT money in the future. Should we, should we come back to the LST? We can point out that it would, uh, could be used for office exemption. Thank you. 
don't think that. All right, do you? If, it, if I had known that, I would make my argument even stronger. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So Does that purpose? affect anything? I mean, I believe that the, the EIT, the EIT you can use the EIT for anything you want, including, including uh, real estate tax reduction purposes. So I just want to make sure that the budget didn't account for. It did not. Okay. Yeah. So we're overall good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That scares me. Um, yeah. Um, so, the, as discussed, the purpose of this will provide about $200 a year in property tax relief to uh, borough property owners who qualify for homestead exemption. Um, talking to the county about it, they've agreed that to save hassle for them as well as for borough residents, uh, anyone who uh, has already applied this year for the school district's homestead exemption will get the number of one, and in future years it will work the same way because you have to apply for the school district one before the municipal one each year. So anyone who you know does that. And in terms of notification, the school district is already required to notify anyone who is eligible for the homestead who has not currently claimed it, that they're eligible for it. So everyone will get it, you know, everyone already is and will continue to get direct uh, notice in the mail um, to sign up for the homestead exemption if they have not. Probably have done so. We did it soon after moving in, and uh, I suspect everyone. Uh, yeah, we already have about to uh, about a thousand properties in the borough um, signed up, and I would suspect that's I don't know the exact number of eligible, but I would suspect that's pretty close to all the properties that are eligible. All right. Any more discussion about the uh, homestead exemption? All right. Let's vote for tax relief. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor of Ordinance 1053 for Homestead Exemption? Any opposed? Okay. All right, uh, 9E, Berkheimer as collector. Is so, the event so, separate? Can I amend this? Yeah, well, okay. make a motion. Uh, I move the Borough Council adopt resolution 2022-28 for appointment of Berkheimer as EIT collector. All right, so which? So is, it, is it still two resolutions, or are we only doing one? Oh, yeah, I think it just needs to be the one, since we're not doing the LST. Actually, the way it should, sorry, the way it should be worded okay. is um, consideration of resolution 2022-27 okay. um, to appoint Berkheimer to keep the numbering in order. Okay. So okay. To withdraw your... I will withdraw and say I move the borough council to resolution 2022-27 for appointment of Berkheimer as EIT collector. Is there a second? Second. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to check. Are we sure that's the right number? Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't matter. All right, it will be yeah. 20. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right, so Berkheimer is, is the EIT collector for the whole county. Uh, they you know, negotiate a rate with the county, for, with all municipalities in the county. So this is. All right, we don't have a choice in who the EIT collector is. Yeah. Any other discussion? <laughs> all right. Uh, we're voting on appointing Berkheimer as EIT collector. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Uh, yeah, we can do it right now. Um, so sorry. Point of order. Um, sorry, this isn't. I did correct this with the uh, agenda. Um, I, 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 I thought it was supposed to be down the motion sheet, but um, for item nine C. In addition to that ordinance, council needs to approve a um, a resolution for the um, for the homestead exemption as well. So the ordinance sets up the homestead exemption. The resolution actually specifies how much it is. So um, we actually do need a motion as well. And this will get our numbering back on track yeah. with resolutions uh, for resolution 2022-28. That would be for the homestead exemption, uh, which would be in the amount of twenty thousand five hundred for eligible properties. Right. Okay, so would someone like to make a motion to pass or for to consider a resolution to set the homestead exemption at twenty thousand five hundred? So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, I'll just note that the number of twenty thousand five hundred is there, so that the refund is about two is a little over two hundred dollars. It's the closest we could get to make it two hundred dollars for home. Um, any other discussion? Okay, we're going to vote on making the homestead exemption 20500 All those in favor? 
Any opposed? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to go back to 9F, which has been changed. So I'd like to make the, uh, the amended 9F motion. Michelle, you covered that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that was before, that was like 20 minutes ago. Someone would like to move that we consider resolution 2022-30 to uh, point Samantha Bryant. No, 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 it would be 2022 okay, So we consider it would be consideration of resolution 2022-29 um, to appoint Samantha Bryant as borough liaison to Burke Hunter. Everyone would like to make that motion. So moved. Okay, three seconds. Second. Okay, uh, Rod. Uh, Samantha, you want to? Um, it's pretty straightforward. Down. Someone from the borough has to be designated as the person who's going to deal with Burkheimer for us. And as borough treasurer, it seemed like I would be the best person. Okay. Discussion? All right, we're going to vote on appointing uh, Andrew Bryant to be the borough liaison to Berkheimer. Um, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. All right, uh, 9G. Um, I move that Borough, that, um, borough Council uh, adopt ordinance number 1054 for debt for three Elmwood purchase and line of credit in the event of emergency building repairs. Second. Second. All right. Discussion. Sure. So, um, PFL and reached out uh, to various banks about getting us, um, you know, rates for those proposals. Um, given the structure of both of the debt, um, given that for the three Elmwood debt, we're almost immediately going to pay half of the principal off when we get the DCNR grant, and given that for the line of credit, we may or may not ever end up using it, that did reduce the number of banks that were willing to make proposals on it. Um, FNB Newtown um, did make a proposal to us that myself and PFL thought was reasonable. Um, they're proposing for the three Elmwood purchase an interest rate of 4.95%. And, um, you know, that's just, you know, you've heard, I'm sure we've all heard about interest rate increases from the Fed. PFL talked a bit to us about this uh, when they came in and talked to us. Um, and then for the uh, line of credit, it will be a 5.65% because that's a non-taxable uh, um, uh, debt. So, um, you know, I certainly recommend in favor of it. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions or concerns from council about it. Are you here from? Uh, uh, it's our Hank, uh, um, Hank Van Bunk from uh, East Vernon Gray is here with us as our bond council to uh, help us legally through any questions we have about it. Okay. Do you have anything to add at this time? No, your ordinance would accept the proposal by the bank for the two notes um, and authorize the borrowing. Okay. And of course, I mean, with the three omelet debt, you know, if interest rates did come down, we certainly would have, you know, the option of looking into refi. Um, but I'm definitely glad we took out the debt we did. When we did, obviously, you can't predict the markets, but. Um, you know, the interest rate we got, uh, you know, around 2%, um, you know, a year ago certainly looks a lot better now. Yeah, and, and you mentioned in our conversation that if we don't end up drawing down the debt for the line of credit, line, the line of credit then we, we won't have any fees, right? That's correct, right, yeah. It's costless for us. So I that yeah, was, I'm really grateful to F&B Newtown for that. Yeah, that was an attractive uh, feature of this <laughs> proposal, to me at least. Any uh, other questions or comments from council? All right. Uh, we're voting to approve ordinance 1054 for debt for the three element purchase and a line of credit for emergency building repairs. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. All right. 9H budget. Someone needs to do this. <laughs> uh, I move the borough council to the advertisement of the 2023 budget. So second. Is it me? A second. Okay. So I'm scrolling. There we go. <laughs> so we're going to need a new motion. Oh, I, I do appreciate us making the motion that was on there, but we are going to need to make a new motion. Um, so um, 
Um, based on what we talked about, unless council, I mean, council has any other thoughts on the budget, you know, now is the time for us to, to talk about it. Um, but at a minimum, we're going to need to um, amend, we're going to need to make sure the budget that's advertised does not include the LST and does not uh, include um, the uh, additional parking controller. Um, I would also ask that given that those changes, um, instead of only having a 35 hour a week public works employee, I would like to make that employee 40 hours a week. And that would still be within the. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we're going to save about, you know, 70,000 uh, with the, you know, not having the parking controller. And then, um, and then we're giving back 25,000 for the LST. So that puts us up. Um, 45,000 and then we're talking we're losing another eight by bumping that person up to 40 so we're still um ahead um 37,000 well, what about the part-time part oh uh, that's right so if you put a part-time on it and that takes up about 37,000 so that would still be a wash yeah all right so samantha has made a proposal to put the hours for the public works employee back up to 40. does anybody have any objections to that all right, so we'll, we'll set that aside as a, as a change. We've already voted down the LST that has to be made. So the remaining uh, question is whether to include 20 hour week part time parking control or leave that. Um, I'll leave that off. Council members want to speak on this? Yeah. Well, I think. I think that there might be some revenue associated with having the second controller. That's what I don't understand. You know, I don't understand like how much like, parking fee revenue we're losing. Well, I thought that the parking controller, the second parking. I mean, I guess it's true. I mean, I feel like, yeah. I think, I think in the past, I'm just thinking back that it's the times when the second parking controller was needed had to do with patrolling downtown like the, the station area like after five and and on the weekends yeah. mm -hmm. and that's kind of the purpose for a second I'm, I'm, and also those districts of two hour that are also in good saturday before so yeah, I'm saying you're well, you'll be taking people weekend. on weekends for a, where well, you want to take how much you're recovering i don't know how much you're I think it's not a, yeah, a question issue. for us. Yeah. Yeah, I would wait on it. Okay, fine. fine. Well, and I, another, I guess the question I have is even if we included that in the budget, that doesn't commit us to hiring that person right away. You know, that's, that's you know, um, we left in the budget and we could then see does it make sense to do that, to hire that person? Well, let's ask Manager Brian. Do you think there's any increased revenue by having the second person? Yeah, absolutely. Like, but I mean, it would cover like half the salary. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, I'd probably be a little. My conservative answer would be you're probably looking at an extra five, ten grand a year in revenue from it, based on what I saw when we had um, had a part-time person doing it. So the board. person also was a huge help in just terms of providing another body during special events and that kind of thing as well as direct cars and all that kind of thing well, and plus, then you have coverage when the full-time employee parking controller is on vacation which we don't have if we don't have a second person so, okay. you kind of need to offset the salary by what they you know do in terms of being able to afford so by five to ten thousand it still puts us in the bed. no although because, oh, really? yeah, you'd be 32, 27 to 32, that's more than 25, so. The offset 25 to 10,000 off of the 37, didn't we say the salary was 37,000? Uh, no, well, I said that, I said after you do all those other changes, yeah. putting, before you consider anything, if you get rid of full-time parking, you get rid of LST, and you bump the public works up to, from 35 to 40, then you're left with uh, a savings of 37000 oh, okay. Which will yeah, more than pay for the part-time. Especially yeah, if you consider it'd, it'd, be, it'd be pretty close. It'd be a wash. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So call it a wash. That's the $10,000 of difference, I would say, either way. So, I mean, that's, I think that's, 
that seems like a reasonable approach. And again, we don't necessarily have to hire the person right away, but I mean, we could. But you just don't like that it's a part-time person. Personally, I, I don't like the idea of hiring part-time employees. I mean, we don't, nice we, don't, we don't have the work for a full-time, so yeah. it's, it's a little bit awkward. I just, I, I find it an exploitive system, so I'm not in favor. Fred, as someone who worked a full and part-time job for many years when my kids were younger, I actually think a part-time job like this might be, because you're not talking part-time eight to four and not providing benefits. If we're talking off hours and weekends, I actually think if we pay a fair hourly wage, I do feel comfortable doing that. And, and I share your concern about re exploiting someone. I actually think this is a good opportunity if, if we pay again a, a livable fair hourly wage for someone to supplement their full time job. Maybe it's someone who wants to be similar to the hire. That's what I mean. I, just, right, well, that's, yeah. I, I think I see where Council's going. All right, uh, let's, let's vote on this separately and then let's vote on all the changes. Does that make sense? Uh, you could do that <laughs> if that's important. What? I didn't understand. Okay. okay. I mean, I'm saying if we're gonna if we're gonna amend to change the parking controller to part time, right? we have to decide. You could do one motion that. It's fine. It's fine. All right. So what I'm what I'm hearing from the rest of council is that you want to go with the part time parking controller. So in that case, since the other two changes we all agree on, uh, what do we need to do? We need to make a motion to amend the budget? Yeah, make a mo we would need a motion to advertise the 2023 budget with the these, following amendments. Yeah, with these changes. Um, increasing the public works employee from 35 to 40 hours, uh, removing the local service tax, and changing the proposed parking controller from full-time to part-time. Okay, that's everything. So moved. Well, hold on. Just to make sure, no one has any other changes they want to propose to the right, yeah. at this time. Because this is it. Okay. Let's have a motion then. All right. That's so moved. Okay. I'll second. Seconded by Barbara. Okay. Any further discussion of the budget as amended? All right. We are voting uh, to advertise the budget with changes to the hours of the public works employee, changes to the hours of the second parking controller, and the removal of the LST. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. All right, uh, nine I, the edit item. Yeah, so sorry, this will now actually be resolution 2022-30 um, instead of 2022-31 to um, appoint Berkheimer as the delinquent EIT collector. Okay. I'd like to make that motion. Who would we appoint Berkheimer as the delinquent EIT collector? Okay. Is this, do we need to amend the resolution that's in there? Because it's going to say LST as well. I'll sort that out with Berkheimer later. Okay. Uh, all right. So this, do you want to discuss what this is? Um, yes. Sure. Um, so, for anyone. Oh, wait a second. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Bob told me a second. And he's totally right. It's seconded by Rob. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, anyone who doesn't pay PEIT on time, this would empower uh, Berkheimer to, you know, within the confines of Act 511 and the local tax enabling act and other relevant legislation to um, pursue. Delinquent EIT collection. Okay. Discussion for council. All right. We're voting um, 2022-30 to appoint Berkheimer as the delinquent EIT collector. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. That passes. All right. Information items. Uh, monthly reports have been filed. Uh, we got an update on the on the bridge. It's like uh, it's yeah. um, um, it's moving along. Um, so.
So, yeah, that's yeah, um, as we've discussed, just so council knows, and uh, you know, I mean, we'll talk about this at infrastructure as well. Um, Pannoni is scheduled to attend our January 5th work session to provide a more detailed update on where we're at with the project. Um, our schedule right now calls for us to have a contractor in place by uh, the end of February um, in order to start work, you know, on the bridge for, you know, when the weather starts to permit it. Okay. Uh, new business, uh, new business. Okay. So for all business items that are significant. Uh, 12A is the Master Park Plan Committee. We'd like to start the discussion here. So. Okay. Um, so following up from our, I guess it was maybe our October, uh, one of our October meetings where council um, you know, gave me permission to move forward with uh, figuring out the Master Park Plan Committee. Uh, I reached out to the planning commission and I was told that no one on the planning commission had the capacity at this time to participate in the Master Park Plan Committee. Um, the Shade Tree Commission uh, did provide uh, Sally uh, Anderson uh, as being able to participate in the Master Park Plan Committee. And we have uh, four members of uh, Parks and Rec who are interested in being on the Master Park Plan Committee. I know Borough Council had spoke about maybe having a member or two of council uh, on the uh, on the committee as well. So I was hoping here tonight for council to um, you know see if council was comfortable actually making appointments uh, to the committee so we can start to get it organized so it can start um, you know start actually working on uh, you know developing our master park plan. Okay. All right, so we have five proposed members right now. And I would say maybe leave the option, leave the door open for the planning commission if they have someone in the future who can participate. Since we're appointing someone new on the planning commission. <laughs> <laughs> Two for the price of one. <laughs> and we have, well, we have a rec, open rec and a now planning commission. True. Uh, all right, so first of all, let's say, does anyone have any objections to the five members who've currently been nominated? The four members from Parks and Rec and, the, uh, and Sally. I'm just realizing that we're putting four members of Parks and Rec on the same committee. That's a quorum of Parks and Rec. Is that That is on? true. Well, is I mean, that causing trouble? Four. There's four of the seven members who, are, who are, want to be on this uh, mess of parks. I mean, the meetings of this committee are going to be publicly advertised either way, whether there's three or four members of Parks and Rec on it. Oh, it, it, it wouldn't matter. Okay, great. All right, so there, there, I'm not hearing any concerns about uh, the current, about the four members of Parks and Rec and Sally Anderson. Uh, do we, we, what do we envision for Borough Council? Uh, role on this? Do we envision a member? I don't remember when we had this discussion with uh, I, to, I recall council talk about having one or two council members on it. Okay. Is there a council member who would like to volunteer to work with the Master Park Plan Committee? Chief Garrett? Uh, no, I think we're all over. I mean, I'm on three committees. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know, maybe with all due respect to Sally, I mean, maybe then we just make this like a subcommittee of parks. Again, they would still legally advertise their meetings, but why don't we just almost make it a subcommittee of parks and rec and just, I mean, if Sally still wants to do it, she's certainly welcome to come to the meetings, um, but maybe we just make it the four members of parks and rec. Effectively, <laughs> yeah, it's parks and rec, and they work through to do through a subcommittee. They may sometimes discuss it at their full meetings as well. If they're not all the members need to attend the detail plan. I think that's a good suggestion. Right? <laughs> and then, of course, I mean, we're going to, I mean, they're going to need as part of the process, I mean, they're going to need input as. You know, stakeholders from Shade Tree Commission, EAC, or right. recurring park users, that sort of thing. So, so we'll just call whoever, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, have uh, Ms. Anderson as the uh, 
representative to, who will be a tensor of meetings, but no, not a voting member of the no. Okay. Can I ask a question that maybe we've talked about this a little bit? Is there, are they going to have some professional support? Uh, yeah, so one of the first um, tasks that we had um, uh, in that kind of like mission sort of thing, one of the first tasks they'll need to do is work through the process of selecting uh, professional support. And as part of the, I mean, obviously we don't know yet if we got it or not, but just, you know, there's a certain process when you're awarded a DCNR grant that you have to follow for, um, for selection of professional consultants. And just to, you know, be on top of our game, we'll follow that process. We've put in submissions for the grant money for yes. professional health uh, okay. Hopefully, yeah. it will come at yeah. uh, minimal cost to the board. Okay, uh, that seems to be the will of council then to make it a subcommittee of Parks and Rec, and they can determine their three members for the subcommittee. <laughs> so let me, um, let me ask this question to John then. In that case, if it's just a subcommittee of Parks and Rec, does council even need to make an appointment, or is that more just Parks and Rec and make that appointment? If it's a subcommittee of Parks and Rec, and Parks and Rec will make that appointment. Uh -huh. Okay, so we'll allow them to make the appointment at their next meeting. And let's know. Uh, okay, sounds good. All right, uh, 12B is streeteries. All right, so this is something we've discussed many times. I think we have two options on the table for tonight. So. Yeah, so based on the feedback I got uh, from council uh, back in July, um, as well as comments from council under since then, uh, I developed, well, so there's a resolution that the solicitor put together that it's the same either way. Basically, the resolution, you know, references the two choices of documents we have here. Um, the two doc, the only difference between the two documents is the minimum uh, safety barrier regulations. Um, the first one is based upon the materials that the infrastructure committee submitted to council back in July. Based on feedback from, uh, from members of council, an alternative proposal was developed um, based on regulations from Westchester Borough. They almost literally were copied and pasted from Westchester. Um, and the two images that are in there of examples, I got off you know, Google Street View um, from Westchester Borough. Um, the main difference between them and the first example, the minimum safety barrier is more specifically um, you know, design and more specifically stated as to what it will entail. The second option gives more leeway to business owners as to what it would be, um, but then we'll, we won't, depending on how important this is to council, we won't have consistency with it necessarily anymore. Um, but based on the concerns of council members, it could be something, you know, that would be less of a financial sort of situation for the borough or less um, less of an impediment for implementation. Um, so um, you know, those are the two options teed up for council. Um, you could decide to go with one or the other, you could go decide with neither. Um, you know, I just wanted to prepare, based on the feedback I've heard, these are the options that I've prepared for you so far here. Uh, Bob, do you want to talk about this? Well, the only little history, but because I'm not really familiar enough with the two options. Is it two Westchester options, or just the Westchester no. option and what we currently have? Uh, well, uh, not, well, we technically don't have anything. Um, well, so the first option is options. the first option is what the infrastructure committee proposed to Borough Council uh, back in July. Okay. And then the second option is based upon some of the feedback from that meeting. This okay. is Westchester. Okay, so now I, now I know how to address it. So like, I'll just address the feasibility of like pursuing the, the infrastructure option. I'll just address the feasibility of pursuing the infrastructure option because I did look with contractors at how that would be implemented and um, discovered that like, yeah, there's not really, there's, there's not really a very cost effective way of building a, a kind of bar a water barrier cover because in order to do it like structurally do it you end up with a structure that's about two feet wide so for every one foot of length you have a two square foot footprint like taking up 
essentially like about every 10 feet, that's 20 square feet, you know, like a one parking space is going to be five out, 10, 20 down and five back in again. That's like, you're already like 100 square feet, basically just of structure that's going to be incredibly wide. And, and more than a, more than an impediment to um, people using the street, even the diners and all that. So, so you kind of had to really, it's a more than an, it's a big barrier. It's a big, big wide wall surrounding the dining area. And also, it's expensive to build, and they'll be very heavy for for the public works uh, guys to move. Even even with a forklift, it's just like cumbersome. And most of the, I spoke with four contractors, three of the four, but one of the contractors were just said like, "This is just a terrible idea. Don't do it. <laughs> paint, you know, paint the water barriers." Like he was just like, "I'm out." And this is like one of actually the most creative people I could find. Who's like really? I, I've seen his architectural solutions. He's a really good design builder, and he was just like, "No, it's not the way to do this." Like, look in Philadelphia, you can see a zillion examples of more practical ways that this is done. The, the second, the, the other two who have big construction firms actually said like, sure, we'll, we'll do this for you, but like, we're, one said, well, I'll build them in my shop, we'll bring them over, but they're gonna be really expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the third one said like, well, I'm gonna build them in the street to keep the, co the cost down, but really they're just a permanent thing and I don't really, can't really guarantee how long they'll last. Mm -hmm. The fourth option was the one that the contractor was a local contractor and he voluntarily built us an example, a sample. And he basically said, like, this is it. This is the solution. This is the only solution I can think of that I will build you. And it's that little uh, lattice covered thing that actually the folks up at Christopher Ryan's really like because it like fits their decor and they're like, they love it. And they could have them for $118 a piece and cover every single one of their water bears for about twelve hundred dollars um, and they they kind of they loved it because like now they have something that sort of matches their restaurant but I don't think it really fits the um, exact uh, like specifications that Michelle outlines really well in the you know in the initial brief that was sort of like trying to get us something so so I thought I did read through the Westchester thing and um, I think those are I think those are really practical and kind of give a much better kind of point towards better solutions that are practical and can be built. And then if the borough wanted, to, I, I personally don't have a problem with each restaurant doing something unique and different. Um, I, maybe we could, as a council, subsidize in some, you know, to some extent, subsidize them if we feel it's important to make a contribution, or maybe that's done through the NBA. Like in the same way that we provided grants before, um, and then uh, one final one final thought just is that um, that whenever whenever we give give away a parking space um, on the public right of way, it's like we're we're sort of creating a. We're, we're kind of designating a private use for what was sort of once a public use. And so, um, you know, maybe we also want to look at, in addition to this, that go back to the idea that was really popular before the pandemic of creating parklets that could be used, have multi multiple uses. And like people could take food out from restaurants and go sit in the parklet. Those could be borough funded borough spaces in the street for. To enhance the streetscape for our diners and like you know and with downtown businesses, so that was something. But that was that was a popular idea, like everywhere all around the country before the pandemic happened. And then that idea sort of went away because we had these. We suddenly had a zillion little parklets anyway, restaurants and cafes. That's my my comments. Thanks, right, for Michelle. I'm confused beyond Sorry. description. No, you didn't confuse me. Oh, okay. I said it's a clarification question. Oh, so okay. once I understand that. It says, I'm looking at the packet, it, uh, page 251 of the packet. It says, page one, Narberth Borough Guidelines for Outdoor Dining Areas. Minimum safety barrier required. There's a paragraph and there's two pictures. And then there's part two, guidelines for streeteries and supplemental guidelines. Are these two different things? No. no. So, so um, I, I don't. So, so the, and both 
documents, <laughs> only part one is different. The language and all the other parts is the same. So that's, that's the Westchester. The first one we looked at was basically the Westchester. I don't, I, just, I don't understand. Is my packet different from my no. else's? I so you've got, you've got that part, which is basically saying general guidelines and the business can decide how to implement that, which is sort of the Westchester minimum, model. Part one, minimum safety barrier required. That's from Westchester. More or less, yeah. Does and that then, go with anything else, or is that standalone? That would like replace the, the paragraph that we have in our document for minimum okay. barriers. And so then, I can page with all the red. So out. then we're proposing to combine that with the aesthetic guidelines. No, that's, that's no. because it goes on and on and on. So that's why I'm confused. Okay, so here's the other option. Right, that right? was when we had a Which is a different system. opening. Got it. Okay. And then it's the same from that on. Oh, so we're we're, con we're con proposing to keep the guidelines, the right. aesthetic guidelines, and combine them with what's yeah. just minimum safety. Yeah. 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 Correct. Sorry for being dense. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm glad we I'm glad we worked that out. Okay. I'd rather I'd rather have some figured out than, than not. Do you? So the part of the question is, do we want to keep any aesthetic guidelines at all? Is that? That I mean, that's an option as well. That's really, uh, when I said uh, we can go with either, that, that's an option too, yeah. <laughs> well, they're, they're not all aesthetic. I mean, some of the guidelines are about not obstructing passage and not obstructing rights of way. So a lot of travel and a lot of those actually are in the ordinance. Yeah. Advocating through like, no. No. No, I think we should keep the, the, the outside dining ordinance <laughs> has a lot of this contained in it. That, Really, the, the substance I think, but the ordinance does reference the ability of council to pass the resolution additional design guidelines. So there are sort of the, the minimum standards still within the ordinance, uh, apart from this. Can I speak to Octogen? So we are three years into a pandemic, and I think we are the last people standing with ugly jersey barriers. We got nowhere to go but up. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point we say, like, you know what? There's no need to micromanage this, folks. Here are the basic safety guidelines. Have at it. Um, and we, we let it go. Like, we assure that there is a permit. We understand that it is safe. And then as a council, we, we let it go. And like every other municipality, Philadelphia beat us. So hold on, uh, Cindy. I'm not sure what you're what you're advocating here. Right now, we've got two uh, options. Are option you advocating the, the one the no, the Westchester guidelines? Absolutely. Yes. No, but you're not advocating that because the Westchester. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's what I was trying to get clarification on because we're talking the options here in the packet, as I understand, are ditch. The Jersey, option one is ditch the requirement for a Jersey barrier, use a sort of scaled down minimum safety barrier, but, but keep the aesthetic guidelines that require, like, you can't build the thing higher. Aesthetic right. and safety yeah. guidelines. Okay. You can't have open flames, you can't block water travel, you have to have the, the platform has to be level with the sidewalk so people can get onto it, you know, you can't build the than to obstruct the view of the business, you know. Okay. So those are mainly stuff. You're okay. saying that aesthetic, I would consider that safety. Well, some of them are some, somewhat aesthetic in nature, some of them are more safety, but you know, like, just, just sort of some, some design standards that they at least looks, that they're not, that they're within a range of acceptable. Let me step in briefly. Yeah. Okay, so I think that the, the difference between the two proposals is really what Michelle said, which is the Jersey barriers. So proposal, there's one proposal which is allow the businesses to do their own thing. Yeah. It has to be like heavy side and like planters or metal sides, but there's flexibility on how to do it. And the second option says it has to be a jersey barrier with a color on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that uh, based on, on jersey barrier. I mean, I think it'd be better if we left the option open that if they want to go with the jersey barrier with the cover on it, uh, they can do so. But uh, I, I agree that. Let's set Oz in those barriers. That's interesting. That's a third option. Well, well, there's there's nothing stopping them. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, could actually would if we were to adopt that minimum barrier, would it stop them from keeping their Jersey barriers and doing something else? Would it? The first one says they must be surrounded on three sides with steel frames or planter boxes. So it would, it would break with the Jersey Bear. Yeah. I mean, we can I mean, throw away because if you really want, I don't know. They are our Jersey Bear. They are ours. So they're they're ours. Yeah. Right. No, I'm just, I, I thought Fred made a good point. Like, if, let's say, let's say Ryan Christopher is like reads that and they said, actually, we really want to keep our Jersey Bears with the little white things and we're going to, um, you know, why would we, why wouldn't we just say go for it? You know, it's there. Uh, 
I mean, I'll tell you the whole point, the whole point of why I embarked on, you know, this voyage um, was, you know, it seemed simple enough when I first started working here a year and a half ago of, you know, as, as Cindy kind of said, Jersey Bears look ugly, let's figure out something that looks better, there's nowhere to go but up. And, you know, here we are a year and a half later, and I just... I just don't want Jersey barriers. You know? yeah. It just doesn't reflect just, what I think we want yes. for the community. Right. For just the the Jersey barriers. Did, did, um, did you get those from Mr. Metric, the manager in Westchester? I, I just went on their website oh, and looked up their code. Yeah. Okay. So, because I was going to say, I mean, we got ours from him too. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that the, the it seems like the will of council is to move with the, the first option, which is yeah, steel frames or planter boxes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Open the business. All right. So, in that case, then um, the resolution that I would recommend is um, to adopt resolution 202231 uh, for these aesthetic guidelines with the um, Westchester option. Pick me, pick me. Uh, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get one more of these minutes. I think I was withdrawing. You're doing it all second. Go, go, go. Was someone recording? No, I. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm, being, I'm being silly. It's like the silly. I don't know. Any, any further discussion? All right. Uh, we're moving to Barbara. Oh, yes, Barbara. I just want to clarify. So the, the Westchester option doesn't commit the borough to providing anything. Here, this is all the 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 uh, restaurants right. would would do this themselves and pay for it themselves. If if we were wanting to do something for them, that would be a different that would be a, a decision down the road um i just wanted to make that clear because the other option was saying the borough would provide them so i think there's probably going to be a cost savings for them to implement i mean planters can't be that much right well not not to belabor this but, but <laughs> during the pandemic when the borough gave some sum of money to the business association business association now i think then allocated that to businesses based on their need for services did that program work how well? It was a matching program that we did. And, and to your point, I mean, we are giving a public spot. Mm -hmm. Permanent. So we really are semi permanently giving. So it's kind of like it's an investment. Yeah. We're already making an investment. Yeah. Right. You have the parking room. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think right now we're just considering this resolution mm -hmm. rather than any subsidies. Um, any other discussion of this resolution? All right, we're voting on the um, uh, outdoor dining guidelines requiring steel frames or planter boxes along with the uh, uh, the supplemental guidelines. Um, and, and this would go into effect when? It'll go into effect when the current permits expire. Which is when? Uh, about five months from now. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. Uh, all those in favor? Yeah. <laughs> all right. We did it. Uh, I want one for my yard, just as like a tiger. Oh, don't, don't get don't get too cheerful. Twelve C, twelve C parking regulations. Okay. So um, let's begin this discussion uh, with uh, a summary of what the parking committee discussed in their last meeting. And, um, yeah. Recommendations so far. Yes. Making a note about that last thing so that I, <laughs> although I'm not sure I'll ever forget it because that was quite a discussion. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, she's going to, she's probably going to have some stuff for us too. Can you make her so she can share her screen? I don't, I don't have anything to share just yet, but I will. Um, so, um, bear with me. I have to shift to my gears. <laughs> All right. So um, I just want to first um, remind everyone of a couple of things about um, the proposed changes in parking. Um, these changes only apply to existing two-hour zones. 
Um, they don't apply to any other streets. Um, and the two hour zones that are in place are there because residents have requested them in the past. They were not imposed on any residents by the borough. They were there because residents felt they were needed. So, um, so I wanna talk first about the enforcement period. We currently have a number of enforcement periods in the borough, <clears throat> especially on the north side of the borough. <clears throat> we have eight to six, eight to eight, 10 to eight, six to eight, <laughs> Some effective Monday through Friday, some effective Monday through Saturday. So we have a lot of combinations. Um, the parking study and the parking study task force both recommended a streamlining of those periods um, to make it easier for folks to understand what the rules were um, and to make it easier to enforce it. And so that call for streamlining was one of the reasons for the parking committee recommending 24 seven enforcement. The other reason was we thought this would increase parking protection for people. They were already concerned about their parking so ability. So this would increase that. Now we heard a lot from the public um, about the, uh, the fact that no, we really don't need that increase in parking protection. Um, we, we think the, um, current hours that we have are fine. What's interesting, though, is there were a number of people who stated their the current hours in their emails, and it's not quite what their current hours are posted as. So there's confusion even for people who live on these blocks. So that that tells me too that there's a, a need for a little a little streamlining. So so the committee still feels that it is appropriate for us to take a look at what the current periods are and um, come up with something that is more consistent, not necessarily throughout the borough, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but just more consistent um, within certain areas. So, but before we can do that, we've realized that um, we don't have a completely accurate summary of what the current enforcement periods are, are what they're posted as. Um, and you'd like to think you could look in the borough code and say, okay, this is what they are. But the borough code has not been kept up to date historically. In fact, um, there are certain areas where we have two hour zones posted not even in the code right now. So their cleanup needs to be done. So the committee has asked um, the staff to um, go back and make sure we have an accurate summary or recording of that so that the committee can look at ways to simplify the enforcement periods based on the needs of the affected areas. So for instance, areas near the two business districts, Haverford and Montgomery Avenue, may need protection Monday through Saturday because um, there, there may be, whereas other areas might only need Monday through Friday. You know, if you're an area that's near a restaurant and other evening activities, you might need enforcement to 8 p.m., where other areas you only need it till 6. So we want to take a look at that and see, can we come up with some consistency in those different areas? Our goal is to have one enforcement period for each neighborhood. Remember, the uh, that's kind of taking the the map that Nelson Nygaard put together where they kind of divided Narberth into North, Central, and South, um, with the understanding that we might need to change the neighborhood boundaries on the North side to accomplish that. We might need to tweak that a little bit. Um, regarding the South side, which is where we got the majority of um, public comments from, the majority of the streets on the South side appear to be posted eight to six, Monday through Friday. Um, there are a few outliers. So we're going to look at those and we hope with the hope that it makes sense to change them to be consistent with the rest of the South side. So that we can have just this one enforcement period for the South side. So that's, that's what the committee would like to do. Um, I, I'd like to hear whether um, anybody on council has concerns about that before we talk about fees. Concerns or questions? 
So. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any concerns here, so I think go ahead and uh, pursue okay. that, uh, that line of inquiry. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, and I just thought of one other thing I wanted to mention. We we've asked to have this um, inventory ready in time for us to. Um, look at this a little in a little bit in advance of our December 9th um, parking committee meeting. So hopefully we can um, have a good sense of what the enforcement periods should be coming out of that meeting. That's that's our that's our plan. All right. Let me just say for the sake of the community that uh, so this is us uh, moving away from the 24/7 enforcement proposal. This is going to result in most streets having the same times that they currently have. We're merely trying to, at this point, rationalize it a little so that uh, it's gonna be easier for us to enforce, but most streets should have the same hours of enforcement that they currently do uh, under what comes out of the, under the proposal that's gonna come out of parking committee. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Okay. Um so the the next thing that I wanted us to talk about, and Samantha, am I able to put something on the screen now? Am I a co-host? I don't know. Uh, yeah, you're a co-host. Okay, hang on. Now let's let's just see if I can do this. <laughs> you need me to just let me know. I will. It's it's like it's always a uh, feels like it's always a. Are you going to? Uh, why is it not doing that? Huh. I'm not sure it's going to let me do it, and I don't know why. Because I'll, I'll take care of it. Thank you. I'm doing what I did the other day <laughs> in a meeting, and it's not doing it. Thank you. Um, so I'll start by um, saying that the the fees that are that we've talked about here are fees to cover the cost to administer and enforce the two-hour zones. The current fees are $5 for residential permits and no fee for guest passes. And those cover only about 5% of the cost of administering and enforcing just the two-hour zones. Not It doesn't include costs of other parking enforcement. This is just looking at what it costs to enforce the two-hour zone. So with that in mind, we know that the fees should be increased because um, this is a, a service that is being provided at the request of folks, just like if you are putting an addition on your house, you need to have uh, you know, a zoning officer review, possibly you need to have inspections done you need to pay the fees for those permits. You're not asking your neighbor to subsidize those. This is the same kind of idea. So at our November 3rd meeting, council settled on the schedule that you see here, um, $25 for the first permit. If you have a driveway, $10 for the first permit if you don't, and then $50 for the second, $100 for the third, $200 for the fourth, and then for guest passes, $5 for daily, $15 for weekly, and $75 for an annual hang tag. Um, I thought it probably makes sense, given what we've heard from the community, to talk about guest passes first. Um, so I, I want to just say one thing because I saw some confusion on this in some of the comments um, that we received. The guest pass would only be needed for guests who stay longer than two hours within the enforcement period. So now that the enforcement period is not going to be 24 seven, it means, you know, you'd have it, it's, there's a shorter period of time in which you'd have to worry about it. So I just want to make sure everybody understood that. Cause I think some people thought no matter what the enforcement period was, the guest pass was always going to be needed. Um, so I wanted to clarify that. Um, the reason that we felt there should be a fee for the guest pass to cover the cost of the administration and enforcement, again, we're looking at that, um, to prevent the usage of a guest pass 
to avoid paying a residential permit fee because you could do that um, if one felt like they wanted to game the system. And the committee also felt it was important to um, have some parity for residents who are paying to park, they're paying a permit with the guests that are coming. So it just, it felt important to us to do that. So that's, that's why the committee recommended those. Well, the, the annual hang tag fee was something that the council came up with as a group at our last meeting, but the daily and weekly fees were from the committee. So I think the question is, what does council want to do at this point? And we've certainly heard a lot from the community that we shouldn't be asking guests to pay anything. So I just want to point out if we, if guests aren't paying something, what that means is there is definitely a possibility that some people will um, use a guest pass to uh, avoid um, having to buy a residential parking permit. So they're not really a guest, but they're going to, you know, pretend they are. So what, you know, I think we just need to keep that in mind that if we do that, we're, you know, that's always a possibility. Um, and what the committee is, is um, just starting to consider is, and we think this should be in place no matter what the fee level is, whether there's a fee or not, that um, there should be some kind of penalty if you abuse the guest pass system if you're caught you know it's um there's no way to know this for sure but so anyway um i think it would be good fred for council to talk about what they want to do with guest pass fees all right thanks for uh Rob, let's your hand up first. okay well with the guest pass fees i would suggest zero dollars I would also be open to zero dollars for the weekly if we could have some sort of, you know, fine if you're caught. I don't know what that would look like. And then the $75 annual does make sense to me because that saves you the hassle of registering license plates. And for some families, that would make sense. It's worth the cost. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, currently it's required in regulated zones to. Uh, register guests license plates. So if we changed it to zero, we're not really changing anything with regard to guest passes. We, um, sorry, uh, just one quick, um, sorry. I was just going to say there is there would be one change there in the sense that right now you can register for a monthly guest pass, but I yeah. think if there is no fee for a monthly guest pass, we really shouldn't allow that because I think that makes it really easy for someone to game the system then if they only have to go in monthly and register their car as a guest when they're not really a guest. It's too tempting. All right. Uh, I mean, are you going around? No, or? I'm saying, yeah, he's sitting. Well, I've been opposed to guest pass charges the entire time. <laughs> uh, I think the community loud and clear said um, charging for guests is unconscionable. You do make a great point. Do you get to pay some for a seventy-five dollar high tag for the convenience of not having to pay? It's like paying for a fast pass. I'm mm -hmm. considering that. Uh, consider if daily and weekly is still zero. Yeah. So I just I think Barbara, I just want to supplement something you said because I think you didn't mention this. It's important to remember the point of a guest pass is only because. You have a two hour protected zone. There's no other way to distinguish between your legitimate guests and commuters who are taking your parking. Yes. So you like, have to have a guest pass parking if you're going to protect parking for people. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you, um, Rob. I think that certainly I, I, I feel, particularly if we're not going to, to change the parking permit fees from what the committee's recommended anymore, I'm particularly at that point comfortable with saying, hey, you know, keep the guest passes free for daily and for weekly. I mean, I can't imagine anybody's, I, I guess somebody could go in every week and register themselves for a guest pass. I mean, you know what? If you want to go to that level by paying $10 for a permit, you know, go, go for it. Monthly, you start to get to the point where it almost makes sense. So I, I would draw a line at weekly and say that there are people though who do have this sort of ongoing need. They have caretakers that come and they're always the same license plate. So that's why I would like 
but I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can still keep the hang tag option for those folks. You're buying the convenience of being able to put them in any car. It's, I think that would be very helpful for some people. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with everything that was just said, um, particularly if we're not going to tinker with the permit fees. Because I am sensitive to the idea that I think ideally the program should pay for itself. I think that you're, you're correct, Barbara, and that, and that the committee is correct in that recommendation. All right. So, you know, as, as Barbara stated, this, these zones were all created in response to um, community requests, right? And now we're hearing the community saying that they're willing to have looser rules and lower fees and no guest fees, and they're not worried about parking on their block. I mean, that's what they've said um, pretty loudly and clearly. Feel free to go, go you finish your thought. So, speak up. so um, you know, I just, like I said, given that the, the, the supposedly the incentive to do this whole thing came from the community, I think we have, um, you know, a, a responsibility to listen to what they're saying. But I no agree. guest fees point. is not the same thing as no guest passes. I want to point out that if you're thinking about our emails and the conversation online, over 90% of our emails have been from residents on the south side. Almost all of the comments online that say there is no problem are from residents on the south side. Several of the comments from residents on the north side says, yeah, we do have parking issues, you know, particularly because of restaurants or because of basketball games or because of whatever. So I think it really is it's not accurate to say that people are telling us they have a problem. It's just that we're hearing a lot from the people who have no problem. I think we can definitely assume that everybody on the south side is you know, telling us what they believe. But That's we're right. also not hearing, you know, what we're hearing from residents on the north side is different. So I do want to point that out. That's right. But I think that in terms of guest passes, it may not affect our judgment. But in terms of some of the other, you know, it's worth keeping in mind. Anyway, right. okay. but I, I have not heard residents on the south side say we don't want. Maybe some people said we don't want guest passes. It's different to say I don't want guest passes. So say I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> okay. I think the other thing that's really right. important to remember is another thing that I hope that we will pass in this ordinance that we will keep with the committee's recommendation to have a program wherein a block or two blocks or whatever. Uh, we have to define that, by the way, you can opt out of the permit program. So if you literally, literally are in the south side and you, at some point, somebody in the past, you know, had a two-hour zone on your block and it's ridiculous but you don't think you need it, you know, talk to your neighbors so you can petition the borough um, on some trial basis, maybe remove it, see if that's working, and then ultimately take it away altogether. But there's one little technical point I'm going to ask the committee since you're still working on this to give some thought to who would be able to do that petitioning. Do you need an address on that street? Do you need, because I say this because, and I was gonna always bring a map, but I didn't think we are gonna get this into the details. If you live on the south side, you know that probably the street that would most likely to get train parking is south at 6th Avenue, right? The whole way up from the train, south at 6th Avenue, all the way up to Rockland. You almost, it's all two hour parking, I think it's like eight to six. You almost never see anybody on the street, and I, there's only one house that actually has an address on South at Six Avenue. One in the every every other house has their addresses on the side streets, and what's on South at Six Avenue? They look like rents of houses, but they're not. They're side property lines, and so who would be able to petition to remove a two-hour zone on South at Six because it may or may not really be necessary? It might be the logical place commuter parking to go rather than on the cross street. So just to I have that on my list of details that we need to work out in ordinance and resolution drafting. So yeah. Yeah, um, just to make sure folks and we are keeping resident comment in mind as well, a question has been raised at our meetings about how people on who live on corners and that sort of thing will play into this as well. You know, what if your street has different, very low number of people versus a very large number of people. There's certainly some details with that uh, proposal and the concerns that Michelle has raised. There's certainly some details that we need to work out more of how that would actually play out. Just wanted to add two really minor comments. Um, with guest passes, um, it seems to me that the only person who could really apply for a guest pass would be a a person who lives in a home and already has a permit, you know, at least one permit. They already have to be in the system. 
as a permit holder in order to be able to apply for a guest pass. Otherwise, let's say on the north side, if I live in an apartment building, I could really love to go to park in the two hour zones and make myself a guest there. Um, I don't know how else it's, it, the thought is just, the question is how else do you, how else do you ensure that, that um, would like, guests are actually getting the screen passes, especially if they're free. Um, the other thing is just on the question of comm commuters. Um, in some of our, in some of our letters from people who live on the south side, I mean, most of them they said like, the reason we have these two hour spots is to prevent commuters from parking. But then some people who live on the south side said like, there's, there's virtue in having commuters park and for having to set the train station used because then it's, they're using the right kind of transportation if they're using the train. And they're not driving the car. So the borough, should the borough consider actually providing a certain number of commuter parking spaces or commuter parking passes? This was a, this has not been an issue for at least three years since the pandemic started because the SEPTA lot's not even get it full. And maybe it's now begun to get full again, so we'll see this issue come up again. But um, it's still free. To yeah, let's let's let's. Anyway, I just so I just think that that's no that's, I think it's a, I think it's a question that um, council should look at in the future. I would, I would propose that we take that up when the set the law is no longer free. Right yeah. now, they're, they're doing it for us. I only question whether or not it makes sense to require someone to have a parking permit in order to get a guest pass. Yeah. It's like somebody who's like, that's not a car. Like, I think one of these people that just have bikes and they can't get, you know, and then if somebody wants to park on the street, they can't get a guest oh, pass. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I Bob, I think that's a question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, and I think that's a question for the committee to take up. Again, this is where I think we need to have some penalties for people who um, try to game the system. And, and I think, yes, it's not as easy to stop them from the get-go, but we can have things on the sign-up pages that make it clear that if you don't live in a two hour, on a two-hour block, you can't request a guest pass. And if you are, you are subject to a fine if you're caught. And so I think we just need to do that to address that. All right, so I'm hearing, oh, sorry, Aaron. No. It seems like there's pretty good consensus on the change to the, the charges for the guest pass. Should be can I different. summarize what I think I've heard so that I can make sure? Right, I you, you'll do a better job than I will, go ahead. Okay, so what I've heard is that um, the daily and weekly guest passes will be free. There will be no monthly guest pass anymore. That will go away. And um, you can buy an, a hang tag that's good for a year for $75. Yeah. Where we are? I see a lot of nods. Okay. okay. Cool. So um, then the other thing I guess would be to talk about um, the residential parking permit fees and if we're still comfortable with these or would council like to consider something else? And I was, if, if you do want to consider something else, I would say, well, let's go back to the fee structure that the committee had proposed and see what that looks like if the base um, rate is $25. So this is the fee structure that council, that um, the committee originally proposed to council. Um, and so I guess my question to council is, are you interested in looking at other dollar amounts? Like, well, why don't you go ahead and show us? How okay. All right. So yeah, Samantha, you could go to the next slide then. So this is what, um, the committee structure would result in if you had a base rate of $25. Now, you know, you see that the without driveway first permit is $12.50. If we wanted to change that to $10, you know, because, you know, half of $25 is a funny number, but, you know, um, but that's, that's what the schedule would look like. Because when we changed the permit fee at our meeting on the 3rd, 
from $50 to $25. We didn't cascade that down through the structure. And I thought you might want to see what that looks like if that was something that you were wanted to consider doing. In my reading of the comments, the letters, Barbara, I'm not, I just want to make sure, like, I'm not necessarily differing with the committee's recommendation, but I'm, it's my interpretation of the emails that I've read is that we've overcomplicated this. And that one of the ways that would be more simple would be just to have the same, the same first permit for everybody. Just as you know, still do the some many people thought that the that the escalating rates made sense because they're just basically you know your neighbors if they're storing more cars, it should cost them a little more. Um, but some people thought it was just too complicated to be charging different rates for, for driveways and not for driveways. And um, I kind of thought a lot about that because like we're actually doing it the opposite way. We, we actually are, are proposing to do it the opposite way of the high cost of free parking argument, mm -hmm. which basically says that if you subsidize people without driveways, you're, 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 you're messing with the value of the housing market in that you're creating higher value small houses mm -hmm. in a community because you're giving those houses free parking, whereas people who buy houses that are large enough to have a driveway are actually paying for that driveway. You know, you pay a premium for a, drive, a house with a driveway. I'm not making this argument. I'm, I'm just simply explaining why it's maybe reasonable to consider making it the same rate for both. Because I'm not sure what we accomplish by, in, by making it a lower rate for people without a driveway. The, the point, the, I believe the committee's point was to encourage people who have driveways to use them. I seriously doubt that this price differential is going to be. Do Much you? behavior. I mean, I don't certainly don't think it's going to encourage people to build different size houses. Right. And I doubt it will even make people <laughs> park in driveways if that's inconvenient because, you know, people need to do what they need to do. So, and some people really <laughs> felt that it was going to make like sort of it was manipulative, like it's going to make us having to pull in and out of our driveway and like you know like do a car so dance. Again, there were some complications in determining who had the right to use shared driveways and what driveways are usable. Yeah, all that. Also yeah. needs to be surmounted if we exactly. Yeah, I would be open to that. It's true. The shared driveway question can't really be sorted out very easily. You know, most shared driveways, we have one. You know, that means you can only fit one car each each house, and that's it. So, yeah, I think the the fees are coming down basically. So it's, it doesn't. It's kind of immaterial. I would just think. Um, yeah, I, I did think perhaps there should be a difference of without the driveway, you should get the first permit at a reduced rate. However, I do hear the argument of why are we complicating this. I do still think those are a little too high, so I would ask us to, to consider reducing them um, even lower than what they are now. And, and then if it's consistent to make life easier for everyone, then I think that we could do that. I feel comfortable if we lower that. But. Um. Could I, could I make just a couple points and then um, maybe you could suggest what those dollar amounts would be, Cindy. Um, so I think the other, one of the other reasons we wanted a lower rate for people who didn't have a driveway was we thought, well, they don't have anywhere else to park their car. So it, we didn't want to um, kind of overburden them in a sense. Um, so that was, I think, one of the other reasons for that. Um, oh, gosh. Lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> oh, the 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 question of what is who has a driveway and who doesn't. Um, uh, just remind everybody, we are not going to try to figure that out. We're going to trust that people will be honest and say, "I don't have off street parking, so my first permit should be this lower fee." If we were going to do a lower fee again, we would have something. We would we would have a. a a kind of a fine for that, a penalty for that. And we would say that if you, if we find out that you have incorrectly stated uh, your driveway status, then this, this will be the consequences. So we weren't going to try to parse that out. We weren't, we weren't suggesting the borough try to figure that out. So just so you know um, where we were going with that. So I guess, you know, I think, you know, if, if council wants to consider different 
dollar amounts now that now's the time to to put those out for everybody well, i haven't spoken yet so I'll oh just, sorry fred it's okay i've been I, you know i've been recognizing people uh i would say that right now in terms of it, it seems like we're coalescing around generally agreeing with with what's here i would say that right now you know if the costs stay $25 or less for your first two cars, really the significant fees start to be the third and fourth car. And I do not have a problem with saying, if you want to park a third or a fourth car, you know, you're going to have to pay a, a meaningful amount to the borough. Uh, that is a, you are taking up precious space on your street. It's significant. And, uh, you know, most people are not doing that. You are using more than your neighbors. You know, look around. Not that many houses have three or four cars on the street. So I think it is totally reasonable to put a, a higher number there. Um, yeah, I'm, I, sure. I, I agree with that. The great graduated fees make sense. And I'll, I'll just say once again, and I know that you can't answer this completely for the committee because you don't know how many permits people will buy. It's just impossible to know. But my under my only real concern is that the program should pay for itself. So I'd like to set the fees where we think it's likely to pay for itself, but not like, you know, maybe if it doesn't quite, you know, maybe if we find out we do this for a year or two and we find out, you know, we're still kind of not paying for our parking enforcement, we consider raising the rates a little bit. But that's really my only concern. So I mean I really like the committee. You spent a lot of time thinking about this and the program manager has a sense of how many permits we have as well. Like what fees is there any way to know what fee structure would at least get us in the ballpark of just paying for the paying for what we pay to administer and enforce them? So, I mean, part of the challenge is, you know, is the borough has never enforced the annual expiration on the thing. So, they're about in the system right now, they're about 2,500 records. And I don't know if there's 2,500, how many are, how many of those are valid records or not. Uh, I know, you know, there are, give or take a thousand properties in the borough, you know, that qualify for homestead. I know there are, you know, 1,500 properties in the borough total, including commercial and, and such. So, you know, I have no idea how many cars are actually in the Most borough. Most are in two hour zones, right? I mean, the vast majority of your streets are not in two hour zones. And that, exactly. And I don't, I don't know how many, how many properties are in a two hour zone versus yeah. how many aren't. So, I mean, it's one of those things where we might just almost how we had to overhaul our feed schedule last year. I mean, it could be somewhere we, you know, just have to pick a number here and, you know, and, uh, and err on the side of caution and then see how the revenue actually plays out. And then next year, you know, we'll actually have data we can work with that'll tell us how much we need to charge in order to, you know, break even on it. And when we say break even, we're talking about the amount of time and resources that the firm spends to enforce these two hour zones. So yeah, parking that's... controller time, admin time, police time, you know, down the line, possibly lawyer time if it gets to that. You know, so And that's the other thing too that I think we'll have a better data point on as well is, you know, we can tell as the parking controller going into the year, could you kind of keep a better rough idea in your head? Keep in mind he's new, you know, so like for this year you know, he wouldn't have been able to tell us how much time, you know, we made our best guess based on what I saw from our previous parking controller and how she did her job. You know, whereas, you know, at the end of next year, we could have a definitive answer how much time the parking controller spent on residential and red two hour enforcement versus meters versus other general parking infractions. Can I, before you roll your eyes, I just want to say this again. The people who live in a two-hour zone, arguably, and I understand there are some like, hey, we want the two-hour zone outliers, bear the brunt of public goods that we all benefit from. So use the example of like folks coming to town for basketball games, park on Conway, right? Folks near the business district, right? Which is a key element of our town that we all benefit from. The train, right? We're transit-oriented, folks that live near the train. Bear the burden of those folks coming into town and parking. I continue to think it's unfair to say you also then have to pay for us supporting you in bearing some of that burden. 
I think we have to equally distribute the cost of this to our enforcement. And to say like, hey, thanks for bearing the brunt of the business district. Now I'm gonna charge you a fee high enough if you want us to police that. I'd like to respond to that. So, so Cindy, first of all, nobody with a Ford car has to pay the $100 if they want to park it on a non-regulated state street. So the, the fees, even if the fee was $1,000, it's not going to keep a person from owning that car and parking it in the road hardly. They might have to walk two blocks or three blocks, but, it's, but even the highest fee you can imagine wouldn't keep that person from having that fourth car if they really wanted. What they're doing actually is paying for the convenience of parking near their home. And all of us choose where to live. Knowing that, and, and, the, and the marketplace, the, 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 the marketplace for homes is based upon location usually. And so, you know, you, if you're a person who loves to take the train, you, you buy a home near the train station because that's a convenience and you're getting the convenience of living near. So the notion that you're bearing the burden of commuters is really like, no, you're, you're actually, what you're doing is you're paying for the convenience of parking near your home. If if I have a say, an extra, I want to have an extra car, and I want to, and I have no driveway, and I want to purchase off street parking in the borough of Darwin, I can buy off street parking. But the market, the commercial park, marketplace for off street parking is is what, over a hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. which is over twelve hundred dollars a year to store my car right. in an off street parking space if I don't have a driveway. So actually, the borough's providing a service to someone with a vehicle that's a very good value. And it's being put parked in a space that could be used by your kids to play basketball in the street. I know people like scoff at the idea of kids playing in the street, but when I was growing up here, we played in the street all the time. We played touch football, and you know, hockey, all kinds of games in the street. People skated in the street, rode their bikes. The street is not a space necessarily. The borough doesn't have an obligation to provide space for people to park their cars. We have an obligation to provide an environment that's a great place to live. I and I say that the that if you don't have to pay any of these fees if you want to go park your car in a place that doesn't have two hour parking. There's tons of those spaces. You might have to walk a few blocks to your home. So this is a convenience. And I and I don't and I don't buy the geographic argument that you're bearing the brunt of something. You're the marketplace creates the value. I understand. Sorry, I'm sorry. Could I argue now? Sure. I'm just going to say something like what you said, Bob. Okay. Not as well. I mean, I just think that yeah, there, there's there's a burden. There's, there's also a huge benefit to living with the walking distance of downtown and the train station. So absolutely. So I'm just saying, if you're saying the fee structure must pay for the enforcement, we're probably going to come back and say, yeah, this can't be twenty five dollars. But if you're tying it structurally to those fees have to pay for after a year of enforcement, are you really prepared to come back and say, oh yeah, this costs a whole hell of a lot. First permits, $75. Second permits, $150. I think you have to set a limit and, and be comfortable with saying, yeah, this may not be self-funding, but we're not gonna go above this fee because then it becomes a burden. That's my argument. I understand, the, and we all, the parking committee, I appreciate your time, but I think a lot of the feedback I got was like, Yes, you keep explaining your perspective. We understand your perspective. We just disagree. My my concern with the fee structure is I hear you. Like if you would pay, that's a great rate. No one's required to buy a house. So that's right. right. That, I understand that. I'm just saying if we say okay, we're going to go with this fee structure and collect the data for a year, and if it doesn't pay for itself, we have to then increase those fees. Those numbers may be astronomical. So that's my concern, is kind of structurally setting the fees up to, to pay for enforcement and suggesting, you know what, that's a burden that I can say we can equally distribute. That those fees don't have to pay for part-time enforcement and for office time. All the other things. That's all. I would say that we set our fees for contractors to pay for staff time. And for instance, I'm looking at some fees. Mechanical permit, $100. Use an occupancy permit, two hundred dollars. Roof permit, one hundred dollars. So these are, you know, meaningful amounts that people pay, and that is because that's how much time it costs the borough to inspect all of these things and to make sure that they're safe. Uh, and to, you know, we're not going to subsidize builders, um, even though, hey, you know, repairing people's houses, that's a, that's a great thing. So typically, when we're setting fees, we set them to, you know, pay for the borough expenses. Like that's just. We, we try to figure out what the borough expenses are, as Samantha was saying earlier in the F and A meeting, I believe. 
you know, we figure out what the expenses are and set the fee accordingly to cover the burrs under the expenses. So it's not, it's not unusual. We can say in this case that maybe we won't try to recover 100%. Maybe it's going to depend on, I think, what we see. Yeah, and the meter yeah. revenue. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, it's not like this is an unusual thing. This is how we set our fees. Yeah, but I think what you're hearing the people on the south side, and I'll focus on that, saying is they're fine with the signs with light enforcement because it's working right now. That's what they're telling you. Unfortunately, we can't. We really can't set different fees for the north side and south side. That would be that would be uh, that would be terrible. Yeah. Um, so. All right, so maybe we're just splitting the difference here. We're saying, yeah, the south side would rather have minimal enforcement and no fees, and the north side would rather have significant enforcement. Well, I guess what, what I'm saying is the south side saying is the current system is working. That's what I, that's what I read in those messages. It's like they don't have a problem. I, I, I agree that most streets in the south side don't have a parking problem, period, and probably can get rid of their two-hour zones. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's another, that's another way. That's another way. We invite all the okay. Marians to use Marvin train station as a park, you know, to, to park off their streets to get. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's why they ask for those two-hour zones. I mean, if you're going to ask people, hey, do you want to pay more fees, no one's going to say yes, or very, very few people are going to say yes. So, I mean, I think in that sense, we are we are we are saying yeah we we understand your concerns about hours and we agree with you that if you don't think we need to enforce more hours we're not going to do it right um, and and you know we're coming we're saying the same with guest passes mm -hmm. if, if you're all comfortable with guest passes being free you know given that we're not going to enforce at night it seems like that will work but the question of fees is something else it's more it's more of a cost sharing thing it's not. It's not going to change the the way it's being things are being enforced. It's just going to okay. So then I guess I'll, I'll respond to that and say I think the fee should be a bit lower. Do you have a suggestion? I don't know, like half of that, or like maybe fifteen instead of twenty-five. That's the base. I mean, we could we could make twenty the base. Then it's twenty ten, twenty twenty. I mean, I should still probably say fifty or hundred. I mean, like go eighty. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Well. yeah. We could drop the first couple of the twenty. <coughs> well, I thought we said we were going to keep it without the same tomorrow. Yeah. 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 We didn't. We didn't. Oh, we, didn't okay. we didn't actually decide. That. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe twenty should. twenty for with driveway or without driveway. You propose the same amount with or without driveway model. I. I really prefer the, the first one to be cheaper without a driveway because people don't have a choice. But can we define for people whether they shared driveways without or with? Because I think it's essentially yeah, a shared right. driveway is a without. Yeah. I, 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 I actually think we could say without, with, without driveway or shared driveway would be the lower fee. Barbara? So what I was going to suggest, and this is something that the committee is going to be talking about, but I think what we really should just say is if you have no off-street parking, then you get that lower rate for your first permit. So if you attest to having no off-street parking, there you go. And so that might be, yeah, so I have a shared driveway and my neighbor always parks there because we have an agreement that that's what they do. So then in that case, I have no off-street parking. That's a good That's simple. Yeah, just, I guess. Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, I think we've provided some pretty good yeah. direction here without micromanaging them. Mm -hmm. All right, which let's, let's anyway. throw this back to parking committee. <laughs> no, wait. Uh, no. Do you have no. We really I, don't, need I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a member of the committee per se, but I feel like the committee has brought numerous proposals to council that council is then questioned. So I just, I don't know if there's any value in the parking committee continuing to talk about it. I think council needs to decide now. So I can say again what I think I just heard. If that would serve. Is that okay, Go ahead. Okay. So what I think I just heard was that we were saying that um, the first permit would be $20 if you have a driveway and $10 if you don't. And I'm using that. By, uh, let me say it. If you have off-street parking, it would be $20. If you don't have off-street parking, it would be 10 
The second permit would be $20 in both cases. The third permit, $50 in both cases. And the fourth permit, $100 in both cases. Okay. I mean, not to, I hate to, like, I'm sorry to throw a monkey wrench into this after all this discussion. If we're talking about fees that are like that relatively low or different from an administrative standpoint, if we're talking a difference of, you know, 20 versus 10 for, driveway versus no driveway. I don't know, I would, I'll would admit that I would prefer to go with the idea of, of consistency between driveway versus no driveway to make yeah. it a little bit easier on staff. If we're not achieving the policy goal that we set out. Yeah. I mean, what this does is this allows us to raise them all proportionately if it ends up that we're not. Well, okay. So your, your suggestion is that we is that we is that we draw the policy goal. In that case, I think the in that case we can we could reduce the first one to just ten dollars. Yeah, I'm, I'm advocating for first permit uh, ten, second permit twenty, third permit fifty, fourth permit a hundred, whether you have a driveway or not. Okay, sounds good. And that's yeah. that's no change in permit fee in thirty years. That's well. The current fee is fine. No, it's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Plenty of people remind me of the fee used to be like two hundred. Nineteen ninety-seven. I bought a permit for ten bucks. Oh, okay. So, so the the one thing I'm just going to point out is our current fee is five dollars, and that doesn't even cover five percent of the cost. So I I think that once we have the data at the end of the year, we're going to see that these fees are probably too low if our goal is to cover the cost of administration and enforcement. But that's, that's not fair. We're not collecting the fee. Yeah. Um, I've been here for 18 years. I've bought two $5 permits. Let's, let's, let's see what the numbers end up with after we okay. I'm just I, I'm just pointing out we're only doing something that's twice what we currently have. So I'm just saying it's it's pretty darn low still. So I just want to address what you're saying. Is that after two managers ago, yeah. they were collecting the fee. One manager ago, they decided to stop collecting the fee because they were intent on instituting a new, more rational program. Right. Right. But it was, but it was like it hit like all kinds of juggernauts. You know, no, yeah, I'm this not blaming anybody. I'm just saying we haven't been collecting the fee. So just say that it's. It, 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 it is going up for people because they're going to pay more than they've been paying. All right, folks, it's getting late here, and uh, I think these discussions are not changing our decision. So, all right. And I, I do see a hand up in the audience. I'm sorry, this is not a time for public comment. So, um, anyway, uh, do we have a here? Okay, so Barbara. So what I will then say is um, the committee is, uh, as I said, will be at our December 9th meeting talking about the enforcement hours. We'll, um, we'll be looking at um, a draft of the ordinance. There are things in the ordinance, in the code, in the parking section that need to be cleaned up regardless of where we ended up tonight. The section on meters was needed cleaning up and um, Solicitor Walco's already started on that. So we'll be looking at an ordinance. So um, after our December 9th meeting, we'll have a better sense of when we would be coming to council with an ordinance for you to consider for advertisement. But we certainly hope that's, you know, not that far off. So just to give you a heads up. Hey, Fred, can I ask, if we're just talking about ordinance cleanup, given all the time that the parking committee has spent, and it sounds like we've come to a conclusion. Is this something that we could just punt to John Walco and say, clean this up? The, the office could at some point do the two hour zones. I mean, unless the parking committee feels like, no, we really want to continue to meet. It, it kind of feels like the substance right. up has, has been met and perhaps we can pass this uh, off to John now. I, I'm in a position, I'm taking notes. I can put together a close enough draft ordinance, and I'm hoping to do that by December 9th to, to have as a talking points issues that need to be hashed out. For example, I can leave reference as to when the two hour enforcement would, would be for further discussion. I, I did go through 
and again, I, I need to get more information as to, for example, parking meters. I don't know with the new app whether there's also going to be kiosks. Is that kiosk can give a receipt. We have to have a receipt on the dashboard. I think there's little details that I need more information on parking meters as well. Uh, but it's going to be significantly, and uh, uh, from what I've already been short enough. Um, so I, I, I will be in a position by December 9th to have a, a working draft ordinance for committee discussion. But there's still going to need to be discussions. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, John. I'll say, I, I agree. I think that you've made enough changes, and this is a big enough piece that I, I think it would benefit from uh, the committee looking at it. Barbara, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think that the committee needs to weigh in on what the enforcement period should be. I think that, you know, it, it, there'll be some things that we want to talk about in considering that. So I, I think it makes sense, Cindy. I, um, I'm not suggesting that the committee is going to go on for months and months and months after this. I just think it makes sense for us to take care of the last bits of this so that there's it's not council doesn't have to have great big long meetings discussing where things are on, on details and, and and the who and how of opting out because i think we, we really have not worked that out how that would work. that's it's important yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that one of the last substantive things the parking committee needs to talk about yeah, is what that opt in and opt out process yep. more definition on that. Yep, that's on the that's on the list for the ninth too. Yeah. Okay. I know this is late, but this is this is a, just um, one more play here. Suppose, suppose okay, you were to say <laughs> to everyone in the borough who's in regular parking. This is your. This is from. This is the year where you opt in, not rather than opt out. Because basically, if we don't hear from you by the end of the year, not the end of this year, by the end of next year, you are automatically opted out. And so, so actually, put it back to the residents because I think maybe like they've forgotten why. <laughs> like why we have these rules. I feel like we're not. I don't really have a desire to impose parking rules and fees and fines and all this. It's like not something we really want to do, but it is something that over the years like actually becomes a major need if it's not happening. And so I, I kind of wonder like, is that a, would that be a thing we could do reasonably, like feasibly? Like just say, look, these are, these rules are in place until the end of the year. Unless we hear from your community that you want to keep them, they're going to disappear in 2024. That's that. Is that too fancy? Can I throw my cynical hat on for a second? Yeah, sure. I cool. know <laughs> I'm always I'm always good for that at council meetings. Um, the uh, my fear of how it play out, based on how I've seen public comment play on other things, is for certain portions of the borough we wouldn't hear anything all year, and then once the parking was no longer being enforced, then we would suddenly hear, "Why did you do this? You didn't tell me." And, and I need this and all that. That's my cynical take on it. I totally get where you're coming from because I think you're right. I think there. I think if we force people to opt out, there is a potential. There are people who would be fine with opting out that just aren't going to want to go through the, like the you know the hassle of going through the opt out process. Uh, but yes, I would also fear that if we went the other direction with it. I don't know. I mean, I guess we could always for people who are like, well, I do still want it. We could just. You know, put it back in place once we've made that change. I don't. Maybe it's uh, just a thought experiment. It's just something I wanted to bring up so we would think about it that, like, that way. It's like that there's traffic engineers who have discovered that if you take all the street signs away, all the navigation signs, the stop <laughs> signs, the one way signs, you take them all away, you actually have safer communities because people drive more carefully. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of idea. When the revenue is going up. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway. No, no, I mean, to your point, yeah, not to belabor this too much long, but yeah, like roads that don't have a line paid down, though, people drive slower on. Yeah, yeah, that's not a, it's that kind of idea. Yeah. All right. Interesting idea. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that is it for 12C. Uh, does anyone have comments for the good council? All right. So we are going to adjourn and we're going to have an executive session, discuss a personnel matter regarding the evaluations of administrative staff.
a litigation matter related to 198 Elmwood and another litigation matter with regard to a borough contract. And we will not uh, resume after uh, the adjournment. So I uh, have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Sir, second. Second. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning? All right, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you. Yep. Good night.